Good morning, Tuesday edition of Glenn Clark Radio. I'm Glenn. He's Griffin. Much to do today on the program. Meaning to talk to Femi Ian Badejo, get his thoughts on whether the Ravens should add one of the top backs in free agency. So we'll do that this morning. John Mioli, Baltimore Banner, wrote about uh, Colton Kowser, who feels like kind of the topic du jour this week in Orioles land. Well, I guess maybe the topic's what's going on with Cedric Mullins or does K- Craig Kimbrell stink? Dean Kramer, too. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, Craig Kimbrell. You're not going to get me to get worked up about these things. Kimbrell obviously was a failure. I mean. right, yeah, we can tell that immediately. Um, Do we get an update on Cedric Mullins? We know that he left the game with hamstring discomfort, but... Not sure what that means beyond that, and obviously we're more sensitive because Cedric Mullins has had a lot of injuries over the course of the last year, and it's the thing we keep saying about him. Can he stay healthy? Because when he's healthy, we like him. It's difficult. It's very difficult. But we'll talk to uh, John Mioli about Colton Kowser. It's Tuesday, so we'll talk uh, college sports with Patrick Stevens and also high school sports with Wes Brown for County Sports Zone Radio. That's all coming up on the program today. Superbook.com. Download the Superbook app. Use that code. It's still Glenn Clark 23. Today the Orioles are one and a half run dogs, plus 175 on the money line as they play against the Phillies in Clearwater. Albert Suarez versus Zach Wheeler is your pitching matchup. I want you to think about the monetary difference between those two pitchers. I, I don't. Albert Suarez actually, I think, like made a, a million dollars in Japan before he ended up coming back to uh, try to try again. So they're both millionaires. Yes, exactly right. I can't think of too any. I can't think of too many differences. Right. No. Other than that, they're exactly the same. It's funny because you typically don't see. Um, I was trying to pull up. Let me see if I can pull up all the lines today for spring training games. Um, there's only one that has longer odds on the money line than <laughs> minus 200. That's the Astros at minus 210. Oh, I take it back. The Orioles lose one. The Dodgers are minus 245 against the Angels. I would love to know what the pitching matchup is there. Now, it's also weird in spring training to bet on the pitching matchup because, again, you know, like you're going to go an inning, but Albert Suarez <laughs> versus Zach Wheeler. That's wild, Chief. That is quite the difference in two pitchers. But uh, if you want to bet it, if you say, ha, they've got that line all wrong, they're overreacting to Zach Wheeler being on the mound, well, then go to Superbook, download the app, use the code GlennClark23. When you sign up, you'll receive up to $250 in a same-day first bet match, win or lose. Today is the deadline. Uh, Today at 4 o'clock, the deadline for teams to put the franchise tag on someone. In the Ravens' case, obviously, we're talking about Justin Matabike. And it's a very matter-of-fact kind of situation. There's no real debate to be had. There's no real discussion point. I couldn't turn this into a think tank topic or anything along those lines. The Ravens are trying to drag this out to the final moment to see if they can get a deal done with Justin Matabike. We haven't heard any reporting about it because it ain't Lamar Jackson. Like Ian Rappaport doing a bunch of reporting about Justin Matabike is not going to get the uh, clicks and the views and the retweets. We're used to, you know, like a, a last look, man, let's be as honest as we can from the fan perspective what we went through last spring kind of stunk because nobody liked the uncertainty and the bat essery that surrounded the Lamar Jackson conversation. It played to the lowest common denominators. And the, the idiots and the dopes came running out of the woodwork to be like, ah, the Ravens might as well just have Derek Carr be their bridge quarterback for a little while. It, this guy's never. It played to the least among us. But from a content perspective, I don't remember what happened to the Lamar meter. Lamar was telling you to grab it. I mean, 
I, for like days, you said you were going to put it back up. I did say I mean, I said it once. How, I mean, it was days ago, Griffin. How's that going? What about, do we nail down when everybody's coming in to pay off their punishments? No, not yet. Okay, well, at least we booked a hell of a day of guests today. At least we got that going for us. What, do, do we know anything? Anything at all about these people and then they're pending their punishments? I, uh, no, I don't. Did you talk to them? I mean... No? I've talked to people, yeah. No, 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 no. The answer is no. What are we doing? What's going on over there? I guess I got, all right, I'll make a spreadsheet here. But uh, I don't know what you're, get on like, top of like it. it's just, it requires a text. Hey, you owe us a punishment. When are we doing this? We'd like to knock it out before baseball season. Mm. We're, we're, I don't know if you've noticed, we're a little thin this week. Google sheet. Not a ton going on because there's no college basketball to talk about. And typically this is the time of the year where we'd like to talk college basketball. But there's not a thing to discuss. All right, Jeremy Kahn. No, it's not for the air. Just. Just this is something that we were supposed to do yesterday. We had a conversation. Supposed to do it yesterday. Do we do it? No. Okay. Is that a problem? Um, not yet. No, it is. It is. If we're not doing the things we're supposed to do, that's a problem. I don't know what's going on. We can talk about it later. <sighs> smooth operation we got over here. Real smooth. Um. It was the content was overwhelming. And every day there was someone different writing, offering a thought, talking about it on their own shows. There was plenty to do during the era of the Lamar Jackson free agency that never was. Because he's Lamar Jackson. Justin Matabike is just not going to demand the same amount of interest. Now, it's odd that there's been no, like, even local reporting about it, which might speak to the parties involved and their ability to keep tight lips. But it's... It is weird that we've heard nothing at all. It's not weird that we're not getting day-to-day, minute-to-minute, hour-to-hour updates because Justin Matabike ain't Lamar Jackson. Hell of a player, though. You'll get the answer one way or the other. There's three things that could occur today. The first is that in the 24th hour, the Ravens and Justin Matabike work out a long-term deal that allows them to avoid the franchise tag and helps them cap-wise as the league year opens. That, of course, would be the ideal scenario for all parties involved. The best thing that could occur is that the Ravens get the deal done with Justin Matabike. There is, I guess you could say, a fourth scenario where if they were to get that deal done, they then shock the world by slapping the tag on somebody else. But there's just no practicality. No reason to believe that that's going to play out. We're like, hey, we got a deal done with Matabike. Maybe we slap a tag on Patrick Queen instead. I, I would be, it, it would be insane. If they get the deal done with Justin Matabike, then that's that. If they don't, scenario two, of course, is the one where they announce, as expected, they put the tag on. The third scenario would be the one that, again, would be about as bizarre as them putting the tag on Patrick Queen, which is them choosing not to put the tag on at all. And I I cannot fathom that. And I know we've talked to folks who have been like, hey, we've watched the Ravens allow you know, some defensive players to leave the building. I, I don't know what the point is of being an organization if you find – the guy, the guy becomes the guy, and then you just sort of say, yeah, man, we're good, when you don't have anything else. With no disrespect to the other defensive tackles, for example, on this team, Broderick Washington obviously got lost in the shuffle, bit of a disappointment after he got a contract. Michael Pierce was great. Had probably the best season of his career. 
but is a little bit older and you know, we have to acknowledge he's had some injury issues and I don't know how much you're relying on him. Travis Jones. Hit or miss. Justin Matabike is the guy. He's the guy. He's arguably transcendent. I mean, he's got to continue to back that up because I do think it's fair to say that expecting him to have double-digit sacks every season moving forward is outlandish. Uh, There's just no way for you to expect that. But for him to continue to be impactful, I think at the minimum, is absolutely fair. He's the guy. You've identified a defensive star. Next step, keep him around, a la what you did with Roquan Smith. It would be insanity. And spare me the, well, you know, there's only so much money that you can spend. No, I hear you. I get it. But you spend that on the guys that are difference makers. That's how you spend your money. You have a core group together that's difference makers, and then you try to do your best with the money that you have otherwise in order to put the best roster together to give you a chance. But you start with the difference makers. And Justin Matabike has proven to be a difference maker. I, I I think that there's really only two options today. The other two mathematically are possible, but there's two real options. Get a deal done. In the 24th hour, if you don't, you put the tag on him, and you hope to get the deal done as quickly thereafter as you can. (laughs) Knowing that the deadline to avoid him playing on the tag isn't until the summer, but given some other things you'd like to do, you'd like to get that straightened out as soon as you can. That's it. I mean, that's, that's the list of what could happen the day at 4 o'clock. And there's no, to me, take. There's no... Whoever the person is that's like, dude, you know, Justin Matabike just had one really good season. No, Justin Matabike had been elevating for some time. If you were disappointed by Justin Matabike before this season, it's because you were disappointed in the context of irrationality. You were measuring him against... You know, Peter King bizarrely suggesting a couple years ago that he was going to be a defensive player of the year candidate, which was insane. All due respect to Peter King, obviously very good what he does. Just that one was a, was was so puzzling. I, I don't even know what to make of it. Other than knowing the relationships he has with the Ravens, it wouldn't stun me if someone within the building said, dude, we think really highly of this guy. Like, we genuinely believe this guy's a game changer. And he said, hmm, I'll run with that. Ultimately, they proved to be right just a couple years down the road. Justin Matabike had been elevating. He had been rising. And while we maybe didn't see this coming, because, again, this is Aaron Donald. He's been playing really good football. You don't run off that type of player. The Ravens have run off edge rushers who had their best years elsewhere. And the Ravens didn't even run off Matt Judon, right? Remember, they tried to keep Matt Judon around. They tagged Matt Judon. Zadarius Smith was a good football player. Nobody saw the next level of production from Zadarius Smith that he ended up reaching elsewhere. He hadn't achieved that here. It was understandable. It would have been nice, in hindsight, for that production to have happened here. But it didn't. Nobody was screaming about it at that point. None of us were saying, well, this will be... This one is smack dab right in your face. You draft this player. He develops into the guy that he is. You keep him. So if we had a meta BK meter... Where would you be at today? What, the, he's on the team? Yeah. 92%. Okay. I mean, 93%, something like that. That's 
probably were yeah, yeah, I mean, like, maybe even it, higher. It'd just be like, bonkers for there to be any scenario besides that. I, I would have to question what I, – look, the scenario there is – I guess they trade or no uh, his contract talks get well it and, and it's so wildly out of kilter like he's asking for twenty six million dollars a year something like that they say dude what what is that but even then you tag him to try to trade him so I I still wouldn't even I would do that next year right I I tag him this year to play him and then tag him to trade him a year from now. I get it. It would stink to have one guy soaking up what would be $22 million of cap space. That's that's not fun. Nobody wants that. And if they're internally saying, look, man, we know we're not getting a deal done with the guy, I, I'd obviously still put the tag on him to begin with. Like, just not let him walk out the door. Figure out if you can use him as a trade asset. And then the step beyond that, would be give it some time, revisit it, see if the temperature cools, see how the market plays out, all of those things. It's one thing if his agent is asking for some absurd number when all the teams have money to spend. When all of a sudden the teams don't have money to spend in a couple of weeks, maybe you revisit the topic. Hey, you know, you're know, you not a free agent. You don't have an open market to go to. This is what you got. I, I don't know. I just can't fathom that, that this seems very much like everybody's playing their cards. And I still wouldn't be stunned if they got a deal done. I mean, this is a defensive tackle that we're talking about. It wouldn't stun me at all if at 3 o'clock today they announced somebody reports there's a deal done. That That's all we needed was a deadline. We got there. Deal's done. Let's move forward. Everybody's happy. If you're not going to get to the open market... In the NFL, I, I don't really know why you wouldn't want to get a deal done. And this isn't a quarterback thing. Like the quarterback position, I get it. You have all of the leverage. Not always the case for other positions. So we'll see. We'll get an answer one way or the other. And, and at least it won't be $85 million in dead cap. So Whatever weird. happens. So weird. Just so freaking weird, man. Um, look, I, the funny part being, too, that he actually played well this season. Like, that's the... Because like a, the year before, I mean, it, and Sean Payton must. It was such an abomination yeah. that, like, in a weird way, a year ago, I could have seen this coming. Like a a year ago, you would have been like, "Look, it, this might be the one that's just so poisonous that they have no choice." But then he played well. Like he wasn't spectacular. He wasn't otherworldly. But Russ played well this season. Presumably, Sean Payton took the job to get Russell Wilson. Like said, I think I can bring something out of that guy. I know a thing or two about undersized quarterbacks. Had some success with them. I think I can be the one. And now he'd just rather not have a quarterback and $85 million in dead money. Man, I, I don't know, dude. Like, I, I don't know. I... I I get it. Like it's it it it's rough if if they really believe that Russ is limited at this point in his career and there's only so much that he can do, it's a rough thing to be dealing with, but sheesh, 85 million bucks. 85 million. To not have a quarterback. To go into next year with nothing. I mean, obviously that you presume they're going to address that somehow some way, but there's a limit to what they can do. Because of how hamstrung they are, they presumably have to do it via the draft. Like, they can't, I don't think, be in the market for a Kirk Cousins or a Justin Fields. Wouldn't think that's accurate. I would think that it would have to be via the draft, and it's obviously not going to be Caleb Williams, Drake May, probably not Jaden Daniels. So now you're looking at the next group of quarterbacks. Michael Penix, Bo Nix, J.J. J.J. McCarthy. McCarthy as being where you're going to have your chance. You only have six picks. So it's not like you can move up all that much. Not like that's an option in this process either. Crazy, man. That is crazy. But, I mean, we obviously saw it coming based on what they did at the end of the year. Like In a way, it would have been weirder 
if they would have been like, nah, we're going to give it another shot with Russ after all of that. Just every layer of this, holy effing bizarre. All right. Today's show is brought to you by Atman's Deli. Man, I'm excited about Atman's Deli being on board with us. I've said before, I, one of the cool things when you have somebody come on with you that you're a fan of is that you can talk about how much you love them. And if you're craving that classic New York Deli experience, look no further than the new Atman's Deli in Baltimore's Harbor Point. Corned beef piled high, hand-rolled bagels and something different. At this new Atman's location, they have a bar. Atman's Harbor Point. Go to atmansdeli.com for daily specials. Man, we've uh, enjoyed chatting with our next guest for uh, you know years at this point, but this year was a whole lot of fun because he was part of our Project Game Day coverage. I've been meaning to talk with him ever since these, these rumblings started coming up about the Ravens diving in in the running back market because I know he was interested in them upgrading at running back during the course of this past season. He is Super Bowl 35 champion and our friend, Mr. Obafemi Ion Bedejo, and he's back with us now here on GCR. Femi, it's Glenn. It's good to talk to you, brother. Thanks for taking a couple of minutes for us this morning, man. No problem. And it is my birthday today on is top it? of it. Hey, so yeah. Happy. But by, by the way, I, I don't even know what the number is off the top of my, my head, but what I know is that you look like you're 32, so I am insanely jealous of yeah. that. That no matter how long we do this. We'll just, yeah, we'll just go with that. We'll yeah. just go with that. We'll yeah. just go with that. You're that always going to look younger than me. Happy birthday, buddy. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a milestone one of any sort, is it? No, it's not, not a milestone. Not a milestone. Right. Not yet. We're not there yet. All right. Um, hey, man, so I know during the year, you know, we talked a lot. You were very interested in Jonathan Taylor. You were interested in the Ravens upgrading at running back. I, as I started hearing all these rumors and this report from ESPN that they were going to dive into the running back market and look for a running back of pedigree, there was a part of me that said, boy, is that is that the best way to be spending money? Like, I don't know that running back, the, the, the people that you had – were the problem a year ago. I think we'd all agree that in the AFC Championship game, the problem was the usage. What do you think of the Ravens maybe diving into the top end of the running back market? Well, I mean, it's got to be the right running back at the right price. I mean, I love J.K. I want to see him get a one-year prove it deal. I want to see how Keaton Mitchell heals up. And I think if you go the Josh Jacobs, Saquon Barkley route, and I love both, but, you know, they've had their dings throughout their careers as well a bit. I think Derrick Henry is probably the right guy at the right price. You bring J.K. back, and I think that's the right combination. We didn't know what Keith Mitchell was going to be, and now that we know, I you know, hopefully he, he comes back 100% from that, that knee injury. But, you know, he's probably looking at a midseason reentry, uh, and, and that's hopefully uh, – I don't know if he'll be 100% then. I mean, obviously he has speed to burn. So uh, you don't, you maybe you don't need a Keaton Mitchell at 100, percent especially if he's going to get you know somewhere between five and eight touches a game. You bring in a guy like Derrick Henry, you have J.K. Dobbins. That that sounds like a nice uh, backfield with Justice Hill. I don't know what they do with Gus. If you bring back, if you if you sign Derrick Henry, I right. probably don't bring back right. Gus. If you bring back Gus and Derrick, you probably don't bring back J.K. So. I know there's not enough seats in the room for everybody. I like all the guys that I'm talking about, and obviously I'm loyal to the guys in, 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 the, in purple and black that are former players or current players or free agents at this time. But if we're trying to win a Super Bowl, Derrick Henry looks like the best path to somebody durable that would be a monster to team up with Lamar. I think that he brings something a little bit different, although Gus and him are probably the most similar um, in regard to the current guys that they've had most recently. But I think Derrick Henry's just a different kind of dude, just a different animal so altogether. Well, walk me through that, because, Femi, you say right player, right price. It, it, presumably, Derrick Henry, I think most people believe, would be in about the $10 million range. He's still at the higher end of the running back market. Why is it worth paying that type of – in in an era where everybody's saying don't pay running backs, and I know that probably hurts you in your soul, and and I get it. Why is it worth paying eight figures, even for just one year or two years, for Derrick Henry at this point? Well, I think that when you look at his body of work, he, he plays like a raven. And I don't say that as a cliche. I mean, he's a tough, hard-running guy. You know, he does the dirty work. Um, I think that his style of play is conducive to the way that the Ravens play. Um, and, and once again, you know, we're, we can speculate on cost and pricing, but I'm going to assume that Eric DeCoste is going to manage that, um, uh, those factors and, and those levers, and, and he'll make the best decision uh, for the team. But in regard to 
what Derrick Henry can be um, in purple and black. I just think that he provides the quickest um, and most predictable play in regard to all the guys that we're mentioning. Um, if you're saying all together they shouldn't invest in a running back and they should stay status quo with just the guys in the room, uh, I don't know. We, we, did, we just did that. No. I, I don't know if that's good enough because the issue is, is that those guys didn't stay healthy. You know, um, J.K. wasn't healthy. Keaton wasn't healthy. Gus was was underused probably. Yep. Um, I don't think that um, justice is in every down back. So I still think that there are things that need to be addressed. And in my opinion, um, you can't you can't force uh, uh, coaches or coordinators to call somebody's number necessarily. That's a whole different discussion, and I think we're past that already in regard to the usage question. But I think philosophically, checking boxes, style of play. My, I am projecting a cost that I think Derrick Henry can get under that meets the Ravens' needs. And I think at that point, it's too good of a pairing um, with styles um, and what that could bode for another AFC championship game here back in Baltimore. Femi Ayambadeja was with us here on GCR. Femi, I think one of my issues, admittedly, is I love Gus Edwards, right? And I've always been kind of perplexed to why there's never been more of a commitment with Gus Edwards. And like I, I would probably have more of an understanding if you want to do better to get a more complete, um, you know, pass catching, explosive back. The guy that we think that Keaton Mitchell was on his way to becoming, frankly, um, I, I'd hear that like that all in one package. Who doesn't want their version of Christian McCaffrey? Unfortunately, there's only one of those guys. But I, the the part of me sort of says, hey, I, I feel like while I get I'm not trying to say Gus Edwards is Derrick Henry because we all know Derrick Henry is a different animal he is made in a different way but it feels like some of the things that you're looking for from Derrick Henry Gus Edwards was very capable of doing for you and we saw that obviously in the goal to go situations the short yardage situations he was you know a, almost a guarantee that he was going to convert in those spots I guess I never understood why there wasn't more of a commitment to trying to make Gus Edwards a more featured back after J.K. Dobbins got hurt? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a good question, and I, I can't disagree with you. I just think the things that Derek does, that Gus does, I think Derek just does them a little better, if I'm being honest. I think he just does them a little bit better. I think he's got higher end top speed. I think he's just a little more physical. He's obviously a, a little bigger. I just think he's an upgrade. I really do. When I really think about it, if I match them side by side, and I'm not talking massive, I'm talking he's, a, he's an upgrade. And, and I don't think anyone can argue that. If you look at speed, Derrick Henry is surprisingly fast for his size. Often has some of the top speeds in open field for running back. That's, that, check that box. He takes care of the football. Check that, that box. He's available. Check that box. His short yardage ability, his goal line ability, I, let's say him and Gus, uh, Gus are the same. I just think that he's an upgrade in every way that you want. You can't have, in my opinion, you probably don't have both of them unless there's an injury and then, you know, obviously then you, if you don't have one. Uh, well, let's put it this way. My guess is, is that someone's, both of these guys are not going to be available for long. If, if they sign Derrick Henry and they don't sign Gus, someone's going to go sign Gus. I, I believe that. I believe mm -hmm. he's a very – capable, really, really good NFL running back. Somebody will want his services. But if, if you ask me, and I know it's hard to say this, but if I'm looking at what's best for the Ravens, and the Ravens are always looking to upgrade all positions all the time, I just think Derrick Henry's upgrade. Now, is that price worth the upgrade? Are we talking a double of, of pay? Right. Are we talking a 30% pay increase? I don't know that part, but let's assume that the numbers are um, fair. And that the, the, you're paying for the upgrade so that, you know, across the board, that the, the price meets the value, which then meets the improvement in play. I like Derrick Henry. I think he could do something different for us. And, and so, um, you know, right now, today, that's just where I'm at. And, I, and like I said, I want J.K. back on a one-year prove it deal. Sure. I want Keaton Mitchell. And I want Justice Hill. So that's the backfield that I would love to see, those kind of four guys. And Keaton Mitchell's not going to be ready for the early part of the season. So you're probably going to need a, another guy. You know what I mean? So – that's, yeah, that's, if, you know, if I, I, I probably talk myself out of it, too, if, if, if you let me. But right now, <laughs> if I'm being just across the board fair, I, I really think Derrick Henry would be a different animal. What if I if I pose it this way? And I acknowledge, and, and you know that we're all just spitballing, and you know what I do for a living, and so this is just the sake of conversation. If if the price of Gus Edwards was somewhere in the neighborhood of, like, $4 million per, and Derrick Henry was closer to 10 if that number was in the 8 to 10 range, is Derrick Henry worth paying – 
twice as much as you would have to pay Gus Edwards. And I acknowledge that I don't know that those are the numbers. I'm just doing this for the sake of conversation. Oh, man, that's a tough one. That's a really tough one. What are you sacrificing, right? Like, who are you not paying? What position yeah. suffers because you – yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe not for me. If, if, it's, if we're talking double, right. I don't think so. Okay. If you can get Derrick Henry – if you can, so you're assuming Gus is only going to be $4 million. I mean, what was Gus's salary last year? Uh, probably about the same, yeah. Was I'm, it $4 million? I'm pulling it up right now. I'm pulling it up to double check, but it, it okay. was in that neighborhood. Um, Gus was on a – Oh, his deal was two years, $9 million. So he was at four and a half last year. Okay, so so let's assume he's going to get five and a half this year. Right, right. right. Okay. Now, if you if, if you can get Derek at eight versus Gus at five and a half, right. that, I'll take that. that. Math I'll works take Derek Henry at eight. Sure, so. sure. Yeah, I'll, say, I'll take that. Okay, I can understand that. The, you, you bring up, obviously, you focused on Derek Henry. I, is there another back of this group? Because I think there are some people that say, hey, Derrick Henry might be swimming too deep. Again, if that number goes to the $10 million or plus range. But I think a lot of people looked at Zach Moss, for example, last year and said, boy, that would be a great compliment to the group of guys that you have. Is there someone that isn't at the Derrick Henry level that you'd say, hey, if you can't do that for monetary reasons, I, I would still be interested if you're moving on from Gus Edwards. Is there another back that, yeah. I, would, that I would consider? Yeah. Um, I think the other ones are too expensive. I like Saquon. Saquon would yeah. be my guy that I would like. I think he's the most dynamic. He's the youngest. Yep. But I think Saquon's going to command what twelve million, yeah, potentially. eleven. Yep. Uh, yep. You know, so I don't. I think he's going to be priced out. You know, I think it's either it's either Derrick Henry. And well, this is the thing, right? There's so many backs available. Maybe you get lucky and one of them falls to you. But it just seems to me that that Derrick Henry checks all the boxes in regard to. He's at that age where they're probably not going to give him a crazy deal, but his style of play seems that to have not suffered much. He seems pretty much like he's the same guy still when I watch him. Um, so I don't think the other ones are going to be available. But once again, there's a plethora of them, right? There's a, there's a whole bunch of them. So, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's, hey, Eric's got a chance full. I'm glad I'm not, I'm not making that decision right what, now. What do you make of – you brought up Josh Jacobs earlier. He's so fa- – I like Josh Jacobs. I, I've always liked Josh Jacobs. And oddly, I happen to know that he would desperately love to specifically be a Baltimore Raven. He has connections here. He – like, I, I have been – I, I can only tell you he badly would love to be a Baltimore Raven. But I don't know what to make of the year that he had a year ago. Is it is it just that the Raiders were such a mess that we don't – you know, it's sort of like talking about Dalvin Cook the way that we were talking about Dalvin Cook, right? Like how, where is the line between running backs and at a certain point we don't know if they're capable of being the guys they were versus you can have a down year because of your circumstances? Yeah, I mean – I don't, I don't know, dude. You know, it, it's, there, there's, I put it this way. What I'm going to say is this. I think Derrick Henry and J.K. Dobbins need to be in uniform here for the Baltimore Ravens. The rest mm-hmm. of it, man, it's, it, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. We can speculate all day. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I understand that. I understand that. I'm just, I'm somewhat interested in Josh Jacobs, man. Like, I am. I'm interested. Yeah. I like, I just think he's going to be too expensive. Honestly. I get it. I do. If you could find a way to work that out, you know what I mean? Okay, great. I, I just don't I just don't know if it's possible. You know what I mean? All right, give me one other thing besides running back that you are most interested in the Ravens addressing either via free agency or the draft. Um wide receiver for sure. Yeah. I am absolutely in love with Lad McConkey. Really? Love that kid. Okay. Oh, yes. There's I think a, he's gonna be a star, dude. Obviously the Todd Munkin connection there, right? It's, yeah, that, that adds something to it. But, I mean, I, you know, I almost forgot that, that, that he was at UGA. Yeah. But I just love his style. I love him as a slot receiver. He's underrated with his speed. He's, he's a guy that's going to do the dirty work. Can you imagine him and Zay next to each other? Oh, my goodness. I think that would be a problem. That is fascinating. You know what I mean? It, it's he's, interesting. because He's I, six foot, six one. you know, runs 4.39, I think. I think he ran a 4.39. So, I, I'll bring up Femi. Look that up if you want. I, I, if, if, Griffin, find out what he ran. Thank you. I bring this up because I feel like a lot of Ravens fans are like, no, go get the prototype. If you're going to dress wide receiver, go get the 6'5", jump ball, 
the guy that, that does appear to be missing that hasn't been part of the group. Remember uh, famously what Brian Billick said, you always want to have a basketball team with your wide receivers, and that's the one thing that seems to be missing. Why would you – oh, it was 439. Well done. Look at you, Femi. Look at, look at you on top of things. Yeah. Um, why, yeah. why McConkey over one of the bigger receivers – and and maybe trying to put that type of prototype typical receiver on the field. I just don't know if that guy's going to be available at thirty. That's fair. That's fair. I think McConkey will be available at thirty. You know what I mean? And I know the kid from Texas was ran really fast, and you know Insane. he's he's talented and got you know he, I think he was all Big Twelve and maybe even I don't know if he was all American or not, but um, I, I'm just putting myself at the draft. Pick number 30, who's going to be there? I think Lad McConkey will be there. Maybe. He might not even be there then. But I think if you want a big radius catch guy, you, maybe you get that guy in free agency. You know what I mean? But if, if one of those big, tall guys that you want is going to be available at 30, then, then go ahead and get him. But I think Lad McConkey is sneaky good. He's just a really good football player. When I watch him run routes, when I watch what he does with the ball, where he comes from, the pedigree, I just feel like he'd be a great fit here. And that relationship with, with Coach Munkin doesn't hurt at all. No, I definitely you know understand. I mean? No doubt about it. All right, brother. What are you doing for your birthday? No, I'm keeping it low-key, man. Yeah, that's who, it low that's key. who you are. That's who we learned that. Fe- yeah. Femi's not big for going out and partying. This is not his world. Like, not. Yeah. He just likes like hanging out. Not, not, not these days. Not yeah, these right, days. I mean, I can turn it up every once in a while. But right now, I'm keeping it low-key. I yeah. appreciate it. Anything we can plug for you, bro? No, we're good, man. We're good. Thank love, you. Love you, buddy. Happy birthday, man. Thanks for Happy having me. Happy birthday, brother. Take care. It's Femi Ayan yep. Deja, Super Bowl champion. With us here in GCR, appreciate his thought process. I, I, I do think if his point, by the way, about the market and where the market ends up coming to does make this a more relevant conversation for me. You know, I have said... I, I just don't think that spending any money at all becomes relevant. But part of that is I would like to have Gus Edwards back. And Femi says, well, look, if Gus Edwards ends up ballooning to the five and a half million territory and Derrick Henry falls to eight million dollars, then that feels like a negligible difference to me. And I would listen to that. I would listen to it. Although I might tell you that I might balk at five and a half for Gus Edwards at this point. I think some of this is we think on the whole the whole market will be down. So if that's the case and I can get Gus Edwards for four million, or even if Derrick Henry's lower than the ten million number, if Gus Edwards is available at four million and Derrick Henry's available at eight million, I I I don't know. I I don't know. I get it that somebody would say, Hey, there's still an amount of neck Derrick Henry at eight million dollars is worth it. Yeah, you're probably right. Probably I wish I wish there was more hard reporting about like I wish that we could uh, this when we do the football offseason conversation I wish we had more hard reporting about the actual numbers in order to make these conversations more educated because we are just I mean I guess one hypothetically week from spitballing yes yeah. we're a week week out you're a hundred percent right Griffin um but I just would like to in order to have a more educated conversation in the running about back the topic, market yeah. Is the I, hardest one to predict right now, I think. You're trying – everybody tries to do this. Track tries to do this. Yeah, Pro Football Focus tries to do this, where they try to put out numbers that seem like they're – but then all it takes is one team who's really interested in one back, and all of a sudden it throws everything off kilter. And everybody knows that one team is interested in that one back, and so all of a sudden they say, well, if you want this other guy, this is the neighborhood – and you would have thought that those conversations would have been going on at the Combine, and it would have been nice if, you know, some of these reporters would have been able to leak out some of the information. Hey, it looks – you're not going to believe this, but the running back market may be a bit more robust than you would have expected. Like, there's real numbers being thrown around. Teams are really interested in these players. Or you would have appreciated today there being like a – you know, and reading through the tea leaves and talking to folks in Indianapolis, there's not going to be much of a market for these backs. Because if that's the case, then again, I can – revisit like let's talk more about these guys if those numbers are down from where you think they're going to be i'll listen to you know somehow josh jacobs is only seven and a half million dollars per year okay let's talk yeah i say only i mean i would somehow he'll survive i'm 
it, it is a fascinating conversation, obviously. Their market values are pretty much even, Henry and Jacobs. What are they? They're according both, to uh, who? Uh, according to Spotrack. Spotrack, yeah. What, is that, what do they have? I understand, right? Well, I, mean, I don't even know. Uh, 10.6 for Jacobs, 10.3 for Henry. Gus is listed at 3.6. So that's, <laughs> like, to me, and based on what Femi just said, if that's really the market for those players, yeah, I, there's no debate to me. There's no conversation to be had. I'm paying JK. Gus. You want to guess what JK's market value is? I think I remember at? right. It was about, it was like three. 2.1. 2.1. Okay, then maybe I was looking off PFF numbers. Mm. I feel like at one I point. Mean, everyone's going to have. When know. I wrote about the running back market, it was like somehow, and maybe it was preparing for a Would You Rather Wednesday, that I was like, you could have the two of them for, you know, $8 million total. I don't remember. I, I looked up those numbers and it worked. I was like, you're going to have the two of them or one of this other guy. And by the way, you know, obviously Track thinks that you could have the two of them for half of what it would cost you to get Derrick Henry yeah. or Josh Jacobs. And if that's the case, I, I'm, I love Josh Jacobs. I love Josh Jacobs. I don't know what to make of what happened last year. And I don't think Femi understood what I was trying to ask. I love Josh Jacobs. I don't know how to explain the fact that he ran for three and a half yards per carry last year. I don't think it's just it was the end. I think the circumstances were bad, but I didn't watch him every down, so I can't say that with certainty. There are still people that believe that Dalvin Cook has the skill set in order to be Dalvin Cook if he was healthy, but are we confident about that? Because if he does, then you'd love to have Dalvin Cook at three or four million dollars. But how do we know that? It's the difficult part about all these conversations. Dalvin Th- is four point three. According to again, according to Spot Track. Um but that doesn't mean that's what these guys are absolutely going to get on the market. And that's why you would have liked a little bit more reporting on that from uh, coming out of Indianapolis. All right, uh, we continue along here on a Tuesday edition of GCR. Today's show is also brought to you by Ruth's Chris. So great to have Ruth's Chris on board with us. If you are celebrating a special milestone, entertaining clients, or simply enjoying a night out, count on Ruth's Chris to deliver you the finest steaks, the best service, and a level of hospitality that has made Ruth's Chris one of the most revered names in steak since 1965. And that sizzling plate. I got to tell you, man, I'm a sucker for it. Every time that plate comes out and it's, you can still hear the sizzle on the steak, you're just like, oh, it does something to you. I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> like, you, you, you've been there before, you've experienced it, but you, you, you wait a little while before you go back, and then you're like, oh, right, I forgot. I forgot. It works every time, the sizzling plate. Roostchris.com is the website. Make your reservations. Um, I've got, uh, obviously, we're past Valentine's Day, but I've got birthday. My wife's birthday's coming up. We got our anniversaries coming up. Got a lot of things. Highly recommend the seared ahi tuna as the appetizer. Highly recommend it. Um, the lobster bisque is outstanding. I just went with the, um, the filet when we were there for Valentine's Day. It was everything I wanted it to be. And I'm telling you, get the zucchini fries. Trust me about this. I think they're actually called. Make sure I have it right. That I'm, when I'm saying what it was correctly. Yeah, the zucchini fries. So, so good. RoosChris.com. Get your reservation in. When we come back in, um, we're going to go ta- find out what's going on. Baltimore Catholic League finals was over the weekend. State high school basketball playoffs going down. County Sports Zone Radio coming up next with Wes Brown right here on GCR. Hey, it's Jeremy Kahn. This postseason, bet in person at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbooks with locations in Canton and in Towson and enjoy the best in-class sports wagering experience at their state-of-the-art facilities, bringing an unmatched sports betting thrill. Gambling can be a fun and entertaining experience, but there are risks involved. If you're planning on betting on the game at the casino or on your phone or computer, know your limit, stay within it. Set a budget and a time to stop. Remember, gambling isn't a financial solution and it doesn't mix well with alcohol or drugs. Know the risks and have a plan before you begin gambling. 
For free and confidential services, call 1-800-GAMBLER 24-7 or go to helpmygamblingproblem.org. Discover your next favorite beer crafted in the heart of Charm City. At Guilford Hall Brewery, we believe beer should be flavorful and easy to enjoy. Our meticulously crafted lagers and ales are derived from centuries-old European brewing traditions, a staple for both the seasoned beer aficionado or a novice hophead. Experience beer styles that dare to showcase the exceptionality of simplicity. Visit our restaurant and brewery at 1611 Guilford Avenue or view our menu and tap map online at guilfordhall.com guilford hall brewery european tradition baltimore charm make the most out of every day in your toyota rav4 available in hybrid or gas only models a rav4 can get you where you want to go in style check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new rav4s from your local toyota dealer today Six chicken tenders made from fresh, never-frozen Royal Farms world-famous chicken, a family-sized order of Western fries, honey mustard dipping sauce, and a two-liter bottle of Dr. Pepper. It's Royal Farms' new Tucker's Tenders Meal. It's Justin Tucker's favorite, and at only $19.99, it'll be your favorite meal, too. The new Tucker's Tenders Meal, available only at Royal Farms. Now you can kick back, relax, and eat like a champion. Real fresh, real fast, Royal Farms. Craving that classic New York deli experience? Look no further than the new Atman's Deli in Baltimore's Harbor Point. Corned beef piled high, hand-rolled bagels, and something different. A bar! Atman's has food and drink specials every day. Now open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Dine in, grab takeout, or hang out at the bar for the next O's game. Atman's Deli, an authentic taste of Baltimore tradition since 1915. Find us at Harbor Point or visit atmansdeli.com. What company has the expertise to make your home healthier by purifying your air and killing all viruses, allergens, and bacteria. A.J. Michaels, heating and air conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis, ajmichaels.com. Hungry? With seven locations throughout Maryland, Glory Days Grill is always right around the corner. They have wings, burgers, salads, sandwiches, and drinks to satisfy everyone, as well as tons of televisions and sound delivered right to your phone. Glory Days is the best place to watch football or whatever your favorite sport is. While you're there, be sure to check out Goose Flights Lager, named in honor of legendary Raven Tony Goose Siragusa. $2 of every can is donated to the Goose Flights Foundation. Glory Days Grill. Great food, good sports. One of the things that's definitely wrong with this country is that this dude still has a job somehow, some way. Glenn Clark. All right, back in here on GCR as we continue along on a Tuesday edition of the program. Tags being handed out today, the final day. Brian Burns gets the franchise tag in Carolina. Remember when uh, we were hoping that perhaps the Panthers would trade Brian Burns? Deadline last year, they appear to be committed to him. It might be one of those situations where Brian Burns is like, "You sure? You sure? Because I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be angry if you chose otherwise." I guess they'll just be we we'll go to the same song and dance again. They're going to be rough. trading him around in October, and That's then they won't. Rough. And uh, rough, rough. That's a t- tough time to be like. Imagine being a Carolina Panthers fan. No. Like you're I, just right. not feeling a whole lot of hope about much of anything. All right, uh, of course, uh, it is the postseason in high school basketball in the state of Maryland. A lot to discuss. County Sports Zone is proudly sponsored by Toyota and joining us now. For County Sports Zone Radio, he is our friend Wes Brown. Wes, good morning. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm very good. Obviously, a crazy weekend, an upset in the Catholic League tournament, and uh, with St. Francis ends up winning. And then, of course, uh, a lot going on in the state high school basketball tournament. Run me through some of the big headlines from the state tournament. Yeah, so one, one of the biggest ones was uh, Top Seek Wind Park. Um, obviously, one of the, the top teams out of PG County. Um, narrowly escaped in, in overtime over Frederick Douglass. Um, but, yeah, on the on the boys' side, they're going to be facing Largo in probably the, the matchup of the, uh, of the week here. Uh, basically, today, Tuesday, um, all the boys' teams are doing their region finals, and then Wednesday will be the, the girls' region finals. Um, so that that's certainly a game to watch on the boys' side, along with uh, Longreach, River Hill, a, a third time they played each other this year. River Hill's won both of those, but Longreach is the top seed. So we'll see who advances to the state title there. Um, and then Meade versus Old Mill, um, uh, Anne Arundel County matchup. Um, that, that'll that produce a team that certainly should have a run at, at states. All right. So anything, nothing that's been terribly stunning so far. 
Yeah, yeah, no, no, nothing too stunning so far, but, you know, this is always an interesting time when, you know, you get the, the, the teams that are going to be in the, the state bracket and then reseed from there. Uh, that, that's usually how you'll get some fun matchups. All right, and uh, the, the state high school tournament produced our Athlete of the Week, correct? Yeah, uh, Keon Scott, a freshman over at Mead, uh, 30 points, 5 assists in their region semifinal win. Wow. Uh, obviously, he'll, he'll, he'll be a, a big part of, of what they're able to do against uh, Old Mill. All right, so remind me what the schedule is before we talk about some other things going on. So you mentioned tonight, and all of this is leading up to not this weekend, but the following weekend are the state championships, correct? Yep. So boys tonight, uh, girls tomorrow. Uh, two more matchups to watch there would be uh, Bethesda Chevy Chase, Walt Whitman girls, and then Howard and Chesapeake from Anne Arundel County. Um, but yeah, regional semifinals tonight. Uh, Friday, Saturday will be the the start of the state tournament uh, with semifinals. You know, early next week, and then all the state championships will be played at the University of Maryland. Uh, between Friday and Saturday of, of next week. All right, very good. Now, it's not just basketball season, but um, wrestling championships being handed out. Yeah, yeah. So we had the, the duels, uh, the, the team events a few weeks ago, um, but over the weekend was the, the individual um, events. Obviously, a lot of names to, to, to run through there, uh, but I think the, the main thing that, that stuck out was the, the girls' wrestling championships that, that got to take place as part of it. Uh, Queen Anne's County, you know, pulled off the, the state championship uh, and Oakland Mills was, was a runner up. So it was nice to see, you know, the, the sport you can to to grow on the yeah. girls side. And I was going to say that, that they have not. This is still fairly relatively young for the girls championships, right? Yep. Yep. So that's significant, obviously means a great deal. And then I know, believe it or not, like we're getting into um, uh, high school lacrosse season at the at the private school level. Like I know I've got a Spalding game on Friday night. That I'm working, so like we're, I, while you have to wait out the uh, the end of um, the basketball season at the public school level, but we're already starting to dip into the spring at the private school level, correct? Yep, yep. And the the, the public school level is not not too far behind. I think they start the Thursday after the basketball championship, okay, championship. so they've already got tryouts and all that stuff working on. Um, so it should be it should be a fun fun few weeks here as we transition seasons. All right, remind everybody what they're gonna find when they go to countysportszone.com. Yeah, so so county sports uh, is your home for you know all the scores, schedules, brackets, a- a- anything you could possibly need in terms of, of high school sports. Um, we've also got a, a pick 'em game that that's live for the playoffs. So for tonight's games, we have we have three different individual game slates uh, that you can pick from. Just just choose some winners and, and battle some other people on the leaderboards. Um, but yeah, so we'll have the the state tournament brackets coming out uh, tomorrow for the boys and Thursday for the girls. Um, and yeah, all that's going to lead up to obviously the the championships next week. And that's of course all brought to you by your local Toyota dealer and by a Toyota dot com. And remind everybody where they can find you and CSC on social media. Yep, uh, at CSC scores on Twitter and Instagram, and I'm at w underscore brown twenty one. Wes Brown, appreciate it, man. Let's talk again next Tuesday. All right. All right. Thanks, Wes. Wes Brown, County Sports Zone Radio with us here on GCR. Yeah, I didn't realize that we were already into, uh, like, I, I got I got the call from Spalding, like, hey, man, you're, you're good for Friday, right? I'm like, uh, wow, that's that's this week, huh? Where, are you good for Friday? I am. I'm, I'm good. Now, I, I've had a great relationship with the folks at Spalding. They've taken care of me, and so I'm happy to be a part of that. Um, but I was just kind of caught off guard. By uh, the timing of it all, I got a big uh, four-game weekend now on tap for me, so I got to start. Eh. <laughs> I mean, I like working. Don't get me wrong, but got to start doing some work today because I can't squeeze all that in on Thursday. Gonna have to start working on that now. All right, uh, winding down for hour number one. You know, the one subject that I wanted to get into yesterday, and the sort of the recap from the weekend, and I didn't have a chance to, was the story about uh, Johnny Manziel saying that he would stop going to the being a part of the Heisman festivities until they gave Reggie Bush his Heisman trophy back and went back to recognizing him. And I appreciate that. It it almost feels like Johnny Manziel specifically had to do that because Johnny Manziel has openly admitted of course that he was getting paid for autographs while he was in college and before the rules had changed so in what world would it be okay 
for Johnny Manziel to continue like trotting around like, hey, nothing happened while Reggie Bush was being penalized for similar, not the same, but similar activities. It will be interesting to see if more of that group steps up. Like, I, I saw uh, former Ravens quarterback Troy Smith tweeted something, like, just kind of showing support. But I didn't sense if that meant that, like, Troy Smith was saying, I'm with Johnny. I won't. I will stop being involved until you write this with Reggie Bush. Um, the, the ardent of the hard asses will say, oh, the rules were the rules. Reggie Bush knew. Get the F out of here. You know, the rules were F. We have to acknowledge the rules were the problem because they were. We don't hide behind that and say, well, they, you know, that's what the rule was. No, 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 no. And as a lot of people pointed out now, the Heisman Trophy winners are all making millions upon millions of dollars. To continue to try to penalize Reggie Bush is shameful and is embarrassing and needs to be fixed. The rules were screwed, and they were wrong. Just fix this. Fix it. And that's up to Reggie Bush, whether he wants to, you know, be a part of it moving forward. But this is an obvious one. And I say good on Johnny Manziel, but in a little bit of a way, it would be more wildly hypocritical for Johnny Manziel to continue... Like, being that guy when he knows damn well he was doing the same thing that Reggie Bush was doing. But still, I, you know, Johnny Manziel could easily just sit back and say, I don't care. And be a hypocrite. So I guess I do appreciate the fact that he's acknowledging that it would be hypocritical of him. But it, I, I feel like this one, this unfortunately goes away if the conversation doesn't continue and allows... People to sort of hide behind, well, like, well, you know, it's what it is, you know, our hands are tied. I, I like the idea of the Heisman winners themselves putting the pressure on this group to say, hey, we've always thought that it was the Heisman has, above other things, stood as being a relevant part of the cultural zeitgeist. Being a Heisman Trophy winner has mattered. In the way that, like, being a Davy O'Brien Trophy winner or Maxwell or, or other awards just don't. Almost every single one of these guys has, like, Heisman winner in their Twitter bio. That's how important the Heisman Trophy is. Maybe not Lamar Jackson because he's doing other relevant things at the moment. But almost every single one of these guys does. Saying, hey, you want this institution to continue to hold? Don't keep effing this up. We never forget we have the power. You don't. It's just another example of the athletes recognizing we are the ones. If if nobody's participating in this thing, if we go to this next group of guys and say, you guys don't show up in New York until they fix this, we have the power. We're going to use it, and it's something that should get fixed. Hour number one of today's program is winding down. When we come back in, John Mioli of the Baltimore Banner. We're going to talk a little more Colton Kowser and the Orioles outfield glut next on GCR. Craving that classic New York deli experience? Look no further than the new Atman's Deli in Baltimore's Harbor Point. Corned beef piled high, hand-rolled bagels, and something different. A bar! Atman's has food and drink specials every day. Now open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Dine in, grab takeout, or hang out at the bar for the next O's game. Atman's Deli, an authentic taste of Baltimore tradition since 1915. Find us at Harbor Point or visit atmansdeli.com. Why bet with the big boys this football season? Instead, try your hand with the local book, Superbook Sports, this fall. Superbook Sports is the book next door. Just a dedicated team of the best odds makers in Las Vegas, making sure you get the best prices and parlays anywhere. And now, Superbook will give you a bonus of up to $250 when you sign up and wager on the same day and use the promo code GlennClark23, G-L-E-N-N-C-L-A-R-K-2-3. So bet with the best. 
best and use the promo code GlennClark23 this football season with Superbook Sports. Visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Whether you're celebrating a special milestone, entertaining clients, or simply enjoying a night out, count on Ruth's Chris to deliver you the finest steaks, the best service, and a level of hospitality that has made Ruth's Chris one of the most revered names in steaks since 1965. Make your reservation now at ruthschris.com. Whether your focus is luxury and comfort, convenience and technologically advanced connectivity, or sporty performance and aggressive styling, we've got the perfect Highlander for you. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Highlanders from your local Toyota dealer today. The ultimate fan experience awaits you at Sports and Social Maryland. See how we're raising the sports bar with our massive 100-foot media wall featuring 40 HD TVs and a 47-foot big screen. Bet on your favorite teams and this year's biggest events at the FanDuel Sportsbook while enjoying your favorite beers and cocktails, plus our delicious takes on bar food classics. Visit Sports and Social at Live Casino in Hotel Maryland. At Arundel Mills, must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Discover your next favorite beer crafted in the heart of Charm City. At Guilford Hall Brewery, we believe beer should be flavorful and easy to enjoy. Our meticulously crafted lagers and ales are derived from centuries-old European brewing traditions, a staple for both the seasoned beer aficionado or a novice hophead. Experience beer styles that dare to showcase the exceptionality of simplicity. Visit our restaurant and brewery at 1611 Guilford Avenue or view our menu and tap map online at guilfordhall.com. Guilford Hall Brewery, European tradition, Baltimore charm. The latest edition of Press Box is available now, and on the cover we look at the promise of spring for the Baltimore Orioles as Todd Karpovich and others shine the light on the team's hopes to take the next step towards championship contention and what reinforcements could still be coming. Plus, Press Box personalities offer suggestions to David Rubenstein about stewarding the franchise. Also inside, Bo Smolka on how the Ravens' defense could evolve with new coordinator Zach Orr. And we meet lacrosse players from the men's and women's programs across the state. Press Box is available for free at over 500 area locations, including 60 Royal Farm stores. And you can always find the entire edition, as well as the best daily coverage of the O's, Ravens, and Terps at PressBoxOnline.com. Contrary to what some people believe, I actually like this guy when he sleeps. Glenn Clark, talking sports. All right, back in here on GCR, into hour number two of the program. If you missed it, Stan the Fan Charles, Ross Grimsley, Luke Jackson got together yesterday. Facebook.com slash Pressbox Sports. You can also find it YouTube.com slash Pressbox Online or PressboxOnline.com slash video. Talking what's been going on in spring training. Obviously, the, uh, the strong start for Colton Kowser, some of the negatives from yesterday. Cedric Mullins getting banged up, Dean Kramer, Craig Kimbrell getting roughed up. All of that on the docket as uh, Stan, Ross, and Luke got together yesterday, as they will every Monday throughout the course of the season, at facebook.com slash pressboxsports. Joining us now here on GCR, let's talk a little bit more about Colton Kowser. He wrote about Colton Kowser for the Baltimore Banner. He is our friend, Mr. John Mioli, and he's back with us here on GCR. John, it's Glenn. It's good to catch up, man. How are you? I'm doing well. What's happening with you? Everything is good, man. I, I, I'm really fascinated in general by the outfield situation. Like, I feel like going into spring training, there was so much attention being paid on the infield. I feel like the outfield situation for the Orioles is the most fascinating thing that they – it's not a problem because having – Good players. I mean, the Boston Red Sox used to have eight starters at, like, every position. The Dodgers have major leaguers down to the 26th man on their roster. I think it's it's a good thing to have. But what you do with that is fascinating to me. And I feel like Colton Kowser kind of finds himself in the center of all of this where – no pun intended, center, right? Um, where, where, like, I, I think he's a major league player. I think he should be playing every day. I don't know how many at bats there are to be the head. I don't know that there's a job to win. I don't know if the Orioles are still thinking about him as a trade chip. I don't know if they're thinking about trying to trade the veterans that it doesn't look like they're going to pay for extensions to. I find this all to be incredibly fascinating. Yeah, it, it is. And, <clears throat> you know, it, there's a couple different directions you go on this. A, it's incredibly fascinating because, like, it's not like, you know, and these are problems, these are headaches for them to figure out, you know, especially in the outfield. The infield we know is going to be uh, a pretty complicated. The outfield is going to be complicated, but, like, there's no 
consequences of not keeping someone of uh, in very few instances, you know, like all these players have options. Like you're going to be in the, in the organization. They're going to be in the big leagues at some point they will be up and, and it'll be good. But on the outfield specifically, like it's almost not Nelson in the room, but two, three years ago when this team wasn't as good as they are now, like guys making the money that Austin Hayes, Cedric Mullins, Anthony Santander are making, um, would be considered vulnerable on this roster, especially if there's somebody making the minimum who can do an, uh, an adequate representation of that job. And um, the Orioles have candidates to do all those jobs internally. Um, they also have strong incumbent starters, and it's going to be really fascinating to see how they navigate that because Colton Cowder doesn't need to spend any more time in AAA. I think right. the Orioles believe that developmentally, like he can't accomplish anything in AAA that he hasn't already accomplished. Like, I think there's a lot of guys who could say that. Kyle Sowers for sure. Um, Testing Kerstad maybe can, um, but like they don't have any developmental reason to send them down. They just need to make sure they have places for them in the big leagues. Is it time, right? Like, and I, I say this. I think a lot of people are saying, "Hey, you know, it'll be interesting to see what they do going into the trade deadline." There's a, there's a part of me, John, that thinks it's time to address this now. That the opportunity is in front of you if. You believe that Colton Cowser is ready to be an everyday major league outfielder to see can you swap an Austin Hayes, maybe a Cedric Mullins, for a a bullpen arm that could be helpful to you right now when I think a lot of people still have questions about the makeup of this bullpen. Where if you try to move those players at the deadline, teams don't want to trade major leaguers at the deadline. They just want to trade, you know, prospects at that point. Like I there's just a part of me that wonders if now isn't the time to go ahead and make that move if that move is inevitable anyway. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just think, I think that they're probably exploring that. I mean, you have to. I, I also think that their philosophy is that like we got these guys and it's good to have them. You know, right. if, if 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 they had, you know done what we on the outside do and looked at the depth chart and looked at 16 major league plate appearances and be like, we got Colin Cowser. He didn't do that great. What are we going to do with him? Let's trade him for a pitcher in November. And then like whatever happened to Cedric Mullins with his hamstring yesterday is bad. Yeah. Then you feel bad. that You don't have Colin Cowser. Right. Um, like you, you feel like you might have made a mistake. Um, and I don't think that they're going to put themselves in a position to do that. I, 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 tr- I truly just feel like they're going to hold these cards for as long as they can and i'm not sure that the urgency to add especially to the bullpen internally is is, is as strong as it might appear on the outside i feel okay. like they have you can't count on a yenner cano or a felix bautista or even like a Sino press or to show up like every every year but i think that they they do such a good job of identifying the guys who could turn into that that they're probably in a phase now where like we couldn't even pick out the guy if we gave if you gave us the full list of the NRIs and the guys who are in camp right now, like we could point to any, any number of them and they could be a guy who helps that we just don't, haven't even spoken a word about. No, so I, I, I think I they're that. probably in that in that category too. So and Jamie Oli from the Baltimore Banner is with us here in GCR. So what do we read, if anything, into Colton Kowser's hot start to the spring? Like I, I know you wrote about the, the some of the changes that he's made, the adjustments that he's made. Do do we read into it as this being his arrival or, hey, remember, this is spring training that we're talking about. The wind is blowing in Sarasota. Let's not go too crazy thinking that this is Colton Kowser's moment. Yeah, I, I think there's probably a decent part of this pie chart. And, you know, as he hit the first home run, um, that walk off on the first day, I was talking to somebody in the organization about him. I you knew I was doing the story and I basically said offhand that, you know, you know, especially in spring training, like he crushes fastballs and he doesn't crush non-fastballs. That's his, that's the book on him at this point. And in spring training, you're going to get a lot of fastballs because guys are getting their work in and they're trying to just work on stuff and you're going to get fastballs and, and he's going to hit them and he's hitting them so far. Um, he showed in the big leagues that he needs to hit them well at the big league level to succeed. And because other things can challenge him, if this is, if what he did with his swing allows him to hit fastballs better, which by all accounts it does, and we're talking about a different player. Um, at the same time, he has hit everywhere. He's like he's a natural hitter. He has that's that's just what he is. The only time he didn't hit 
is the six weeks that he was in the big leagues. Right. Um, he had 60 some plate appearances. Um, usually you get those in like two weeks in, in the minors. It's, and, and I think that what you read into it is like, we know conceptually following the game, being around the game, that it's really hard to make that jump, um, you know, from AAA to the big leagues. And I, and I'm something I'm working on, on writing for probably next week. But like, I think for this group specifically, like there's, there was a lot of pressure and like, now there's no pressure to the spring training. So you get that under your belt, you learn from it and, and you become the player that you want to be. And I think he's done that. Yeah. John, I, it, let's, okay. So the Cedric Mullins thing obviously complicates everything. If Cedric Mullins is available to start the season, are, are you sure? Cause I feel like that if it's if Cedric Mullins isn't here, then you've got enough room for to have these four guys here. You can find enough at bats for these four guys. But if Cedric Mullins is here to start the season, are are we certain that one of this of either Kowser or Kerstad is definitely going to have to be a Triple A? There's just no way for them to find at bats for all of these guys if they were all here on opening day. That's how it feels right now. Um, you know, truthfully, like being home and 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 falling tangentially, um, I don't really, I couldn't tell you without looking how Cal, or Kerstad's doing this spring. Some of the at bats I saw were tough. Um, I don't know if he's turned it around. I I, I think that they're in the position now where like, you know, and I always remember, you know, when they sent down the first spring training I covered with this front office, you know, Austin Hayes and Anthony Santander were having great springs and, you know, Michael Heiss was clear that, you know, we're not, we're not out here having a stat contest. Um, you know, it's not who has the best spring training stats makes a team, but honestly, like that's what it should be. Like let guys play their way into not, it doesn't have to be like stats that we can see. They can judge quality of the bats and quality of contact. Right. But, like, right. There should be there should be a competition and and you know if one guy makes it and another guy doesn't it doesn't mean that person is not good um, but but I think that I think that there's probably a world where somebody has to go down at this point. I, I feel like this is like I, I know I sort of presented it this way with the first question, John, but like I feel like there's almost a fascinating. The Orioles are trying to win a World Series right now, and at the same time, it almost feels like there's an old guard versus new guard thing that's happening within this organization where there's a group of players, and I can't believe we're saying old guard, but I know you actually wrote it about this with Ryan Mountcastle, right? We're like, <laughs> yeah. like it's, it's almost absurd that we're talking about Ryan Mountcastle as being one of the older guys on the team, but that's, that's where we are at this point, right? Like you have this guard yeah. of the three outfielders and Mountcastle and the guys that are coming up on free agency and then the next tier of guys, the, the two outfielders, Kowser and, uh, of course, Kerstad, Obviously, all of the infielders, Rutschman would still be part of that group, Kobe Mayo, Samuel Basayo still to come. And, and it feels like there's this fascinating question of, are the Orioles inclined to lock down any of the members of the older group? Like, is, is the inclination really just going to prove to be, and I know this is further complicated by an ownership change, because probably under the old ownership, we would have said there's no chance. I, I don't know that that changes with new ownership like is it just a, a time of that group of guys is going to end up moving on maybe a la Trey Mancini and the Orioles of that next window are just going to be this group of guys and these guys are going to end up coming and going yeah <laughs> yeah I mean honestly yeah it, it's funny as I'm, as I'm thinking I've, I've been toying with this idea too because there's also the part where like arbitration contracts like can be you can get out of it for a percentage of it by a certain like spring training date. And that's something that, you know, the Orioles did like God, seven or eight years ago with Miguel Gonzalez. Um, it strikes me, especially on the infield that they could do, they could do that if, if they want Jackson holiday on the team and they see it trending that way. But, but as we're talking about this, and as we're thinking about it, you know, the, tr the, the way of, we learned a lot about how the Orioles operated, you know, in those years when they weren't good and they moved right. out from players who were experienced and, I don't know that that has paused. I really don't think it has. You know, Michael Elias, in in talking about the Corbin Burns trade, when he was asked about like this being a new philosophy, he said, "Hey, look, like the Brewers are a good team and they expect to make the playoffs, and they just made this trade because this is what you do." Um, so, I, I to, to to answer your question, like yes, I think that's going to happen. I I appreciate and I, you know, I have personal fondness and and good relationships with all the you know, the quote unquote old guard, right. I think they've, what they went through is you should not have to do that to, to get to be a big leaguer. And they are doing a really good job of their jobs, but the Orioles are going to see 
you know, their production curves and where they are in their careers. And they're going to see younger and better, potentially better production. And they're going to choose the younger and potentially better production for less cost. Like that's what teams do. And ultimately I don't think it needs to be like a, you know, it's either X or Y, but right. if we're talking about extending Austin Hayes and Anthony Santander into their thirties or using that money towards Adley Rutschman yep. into his thirties, like that, if that's a choice you have to make, that seems like a choice that and, isn't going to take too long and, to figure out. And right. And John, that, 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 when you say it that way, it seems obvious, of course, right? Like, of course you're going to do it that way. I think the question is, are you saving that money to spend on Adley Rutschman or is that time already passed? Right. Like his, are they saying, Hey, we're a year away from our arbitration date. We, we, we're, we're done. We're done having these conversations. And I think that's the more interesting, the, the more fascinating part about this would be like, is, do you feel like you need to spend money on somebody like on something to lock them down? Because seeing what the pitching market has now become with like Zach Wheeler, I don't think the answer is going to be Corbin Burns. Like, it feels like you have to spend money on someone at some point as your new ownership that's coming in and taking over and trying to suggest what it is that you're going to be moving forward. Yeah, I, I think I think that needs to happen. You know, I, I, I'm sure that the Orioles know that. And yeah. honestly, as you know, I saw Hadley Rushman's um, representatives moved agencies. Yeah, or I saw changed, that. changed agencies or something yeah. recently. And I'm sure that, you know, we talk about how he is the obvious candidate because he's not represented by Scott Boris and, and, you know, they're probably not going to do any of the pitchers for a number of reasons. So you're basically talking about the person who would be the best to receive this, you know, we're no longer um, financially unserious contract extension is Adley Rutschman. And I'm like, but like that only inflates like the ask on his part because yeah, a hundred percent, you know, you're not going to hang up and call Scott Boris and be like, Hey, Hey, would, can we buy out Jackson Holiday's age 27 free agency, please? Because that's a short conversation. <laughs> right. no, that's a really short conversation. I think we know how it's going to go. No, you would have to. I mean, basically, you'd have to be paying him like he was a free agent now if you wanted to do it with Jackson Holiday or with uh, Gunnar Henderson. Like, you basically be saying, we're, they, like, the world of doing a Ronald Acuna deal ain't happening. It is not going yeah. to be an option for them moving forward. Um, all right. Something else that's interesting to you that you noticed when you were down there that, that maybe we should be paying more attention to, John? Oh, gosh, um, I, I think that I think it's going to be a really interesting year on, on the pitching side. You know, I've spent a lot of time yeah. around the minor league pitching operation. Arms on the farm, yeah. Arms on the farm, we're doing it. <laughs> gosh, I wonder if we're going to bring arms on the farm back. We have to, right? It's got such a fan base of, of you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I, I just really think that this year there's going to be you're, they're going to see a little more of that end product in the big leagues and also you're going to see a little more melding of the philosophies not to say that it was like separated between the big leagues and the minor leagues but um i think the more i think there's just going to be a more streamlined and you're going to see the reasons why there's hope um on the minor league pitching side like trickling up philosophy wise pitch wise onto the big league side i think in a way that we haven't seen before um and that's you know like you said, pitching is expensive, and if you can develop your own, you're in good shape. I don't think the Orioles are going to develop their own Corbin Burns at any point soon. <laughs> um, that would be nice, but to have those like fungible, just like give you 50 decent innings for for nothing arms that you know teams like the Rays have is really valuable, and I think they're I think we're going to start seeing that. All right, uh, at John Mioli, of course, is how you follow him on uh, Twitter and thebaltimorebanner.com. The Baltimore Banner, you can read all the stuff there. John, I always appreciate you, man. Please bring back Arms on the Farm, um, and you will always have a dedicated follower. And uh, go Greyhounds. Appreciate you as always, man. All right. Thanks a lot, man. Talk soon. John Mioli with us here on GCR. Always appreciate him taking the time for us. It, it's, it's, it's weird, right? Like, this is spring. This is the time of perpetual hope. The Orioles have the chance to win the World Series. You're thinking, like, why are you obsessed with this? What's going to happen with... It's fascinating. The way that Jeremy posed it yesterday. Are all three of these guys in the outfield all going to be gone? And then when do you do it? Do you just ride it out? Let all these guys get the free agency? Say, hey, we, you know, let's try to squeeze as much out of them as we possibly can? Well, you're two years away from 
Cedric Mullins, and Austin Hayes reaching free agency. So are you holding spots for them while you presumably have other guys that you want to have start playing every day? Or can you... It is fascinating because there aren't obvious answers. When there's obvious answers, it's not all that fascinating. It's fascinating the spot they find themselves in where they're simultaneously trying to win a World Series but also having, and John Means should go into the conversation, so it's really like five guys, right? The three outfielders, Ryan Mountcastle, John Means, kind of represent the, I'm, I'm saying old guard, which is, again, absurd to call them old because I don't think any of them are are actually on the like downside of their career necessarily. Means, I think, is the only guy in that group that's 30. Well, Santander. How old is Santander now? He's 29. Uh, yeah, I think he's going to be 20. Yeah, he's 29. He's going to be. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right. Right. It won't be 30 until October. So, yeah, none of the. Means is the only one of that group that's 30. None of them are older than 30. And yet, I'm using this phrase old guard. It's just this weird dichotomy of a group of players that has kind of been the core and significantly part of the reason of why things have turned around, and yet none of them appear to be guys that you're married to long-term. We have talked about all of them individually as being guys that maybe you give an extension to, you plant the flag with. Everybody wants to give an extension to Adley Rutschman or Gunnar Henderson or Jackson Holiday. I get it, but like these unique difficulties and all of those things we were just talking about with John. Jackson Holiday, Gunnar Henderson being that they're Boris clients, Adley Rutschman being that he's only a year away from arbitration, has already made some real money and is probably past the point of doing a truly team friendly deal. Like you missed that chance when he was first coming up. So it would feel like you'd want to spend some money on something, say, hey, this guy's going to be a part of it. But we all kind of have the same feelings. We like all of these guys, but are they game changers? (sighs) So if they're not going to be here long term, then is it just waiting it out the free agency? Is that the way to go about doing things? Or do you try to trade them? And that becomes an awkward conversation when, again, you're trying to win a World Series. You're really going to trade a player that's helping you win in the midst of trying to win a World Series? It's fascinating. Because there isn't an obvious correct answer. And again, we use the phrase like good problem to have. It's not a problem. It's just interesting. And it's the subplot to everything that's going on. All right. Uh, It is a Tuesday. And Tuesdays here on GCR, we like to talk about what's going on in the world of local college sports. Fortunately, on the basketball front, there's it's not much, not much, but we'll lay it out anyway. Joining us now, Washington Post, USA Lacrosse Magazine. He is our friend, Mr. Patrick Stevens, and he's back with us now here on GCR. Patrick, good morning, my friend. How are you? I'm well, Glenn. You? Oh, everything is all right. Um, I, I guess let's let's save Maryland because they still have a couple teams. I guess still have regular season games to be played, right? Because the MEAC teams still have regular season game. Uh, UMBC still has a regular season game, right? They still do. So, uh, the, kind of the ba- for what it's worth, the basics on those teams. Morgan State will be the five or the six seed in the MEAC tournament okay. next week, and Coppin State is locked into the eight seed. UMBC, which for a while there was looking like it might not even make the America East tournament has won four or five and locked in a spot in the conference tournament. Uh, so that's good for them, but uh, not, I don't think they can get any higher than the five seed. Okay. They might be able to get the four. I, I didn't run the scenarios for that, but that, but they're basically a mid pack team at this point, but probably playing about as well as they have all season. So let's go with the teams that we know tonight, Loyola Navy, they play each other in Annapolis. Neither team, I think playing good enough to think that they have a run in them in the Patriot league tournament. Probably not. You know, I feel like, you know, uh, winning four games would probably be near miraculous. And I think that Loyola rallying to win its game against Army on Saturday the way it did in the final 20 seconds 
might yeah, that was crazy. Constitute, might constitute the miracle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, how about this? Um, Loyola went five and thirteen in the Patriot League. They got four of those victories on the road. That's very weird. That is okay, weird. they only won two home games all season. One was against St. Mary's College, and the yeah, other was Saturday there. against the Army. So. So the fact that they're a 10 seed, you know, they're going on the road. Maybe that's a good yeah, better, better place now. for them to be. That's a fair point. Uh, I will say this, too. Like, Navy, which had looked like it was completely lost a couple weeks ago, has rattled off four wins in a row. And, uh, you know, obviously one of those victories was at Loyola, where, you know, most teams go and win this year. <laughs> uh, but they also knocked off Holy Cross and Lafayette, and they wanted American, and they're playing better. Uh, and so if there's a team out there that might be able to make a, have a run in them, you know, that might be a, a realistic team to look at, given okay. that, you know, we talked, you know, in the preseason about, well, maybe this is a year where, where things aren't quite as uh, quite as lopsided in the Patriot League, and maybe Colgate's a little more vulnerable, and Colgate went and won the league by six games anyway. <laughs> so Navy's on the opposite side of the bracket. It's not the craziest thing to think that the mids could catch fire here a little bit. Uh, win tonight or win tonight beat BU maybe, and then who knows what happens after that. Uh, clearly a terribly disappointing loss for Towson on Saturday as it requires them to now have to play uh, this coming Saturday in the CAA tournament. And I just never were really able to sustain, like the, for the, the, the stretches where they were playing good basketball, they just never were able to sustain that consistently throughout the course of the year. Well, I mean, let's let's just lay it out like this. The last five weeks of conference play, they split every single week. Yeah. And, you know, that, that tells you uh, in pretty stark terms that this is probably not a team that's going to win four in a row. I mean, it, it has won four in a row once this season. It had a five-game winning streak in late January and into early February. Uh, and, and since then, since, since uh, that Northeastern win got them to seven and two in, in the league, they're four and five. Uh, it's just just not quite there, uh, just not enough offense on a sustainable enough basis to be able to get the job done. So, you know, they'll see North. They'll play the exact same combination that they did last week. Yeah, they, in all likelihood, uh, well, I shouldn't say in all likelihood. They'll play North Carolina A and T or William and Mary, um, and then they'll play UNC Wilmington if they win that game on Sunday. So, I think I think Towson can win a couple games in that tournament, but. I, I'm not, I don't see a, I don't see a four games in four days uh, for this particular edition of the Tigers. They're just a little too offensively challenged. And then there's Maryland basketball. Um, I got nothing. You got anything? You know, I, I tweeted this out on Sunday, but the thought came to me as I was driving home from the Northwestern game last Wednesday that what this season most resembles is like a four-month-long game of a carnival ring toss game where it's basically (laughs) you just can't you can't toss the ring onto the onto the rack or whatever onto the rung uh you can't put the ball in the basket and that's basically what this season has been for maryland and it, it you know they actually played decent offense the other day and their defense let them down uh and you know i think that both of those games last week at home where you had at least something marginal to possibly play for. Uh, and now you're basically locked into playing on the first day of the conference tournament. Um, it, it, it's a season that it, it, it had the feel in the building of, you know, just get this over with. Uh, just, just, just get this to the end point one way or the other. I think the only thing, you know, really at this point that Maryland realistically has to play for is avoiding a losing season, which it would do uh, if it does win at Penn State on Sunday, worse they could be then is 16 and 16. But if they lose at Penn State, they're going to have to win twice in the Big Ten tournament to avoid finishing under 500 this year. Yeah, and the good news is they've always been so good at Penn State, so they got that. Yeah, they got that yeah. for them, which is nice. But I mean, you know, it, they, they they've won two games since the start of February. Yeah, yeah. It I is mean, it, that, that, that's Patrick. Is it weird the timing with Mike Jones? Like, I think a lot of people asked that last week, or or like, is it sort of the acknowledgement of, hey, we're not doing anything anyway, just just go right ahead. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't find it to be particularly shocking one way or the other. I mean, they had a guy they wanted to hire and they got him locked in. So, uh, you know, I think if you're, if you're old dominion, you, you, you act quick. Uh, you know, there's people that believe one way or the other that, you know, that, that hiring coaches is a race, but in this particular case, um, you look at it and ultimately, um, 
you know, they knew who they wanted. It's an alum. It's somebody that, that knows the program. And as much as it pains me to say, you know, portal season starts in a week and a half. That's true. Uh, so if you're if you got your guy locked in, you probably might as well do it at that point. Uh, so, you know, certainly Mike Jones played his cards very, very well over the last few years, going from DeMatha to Virginia Tech to Maryland to being a Division One head coach. Uh, so good for him. And he certainly has a little bit of work to do with an old Dominion program that it struggled this season, but I also think has the chance to be one of the best programs of the Sun Belt moving forward. All right, we'll dive more into this next week as we get ready for like the the throw of, of conference tournament week. But can you you lay out some of the storylines as far as the bubble is concerned right now, going into the final two weeks of the season? What are the bigger storylines? Well, I I think some of it comes down to what. Uh, what do you make of the Big East borderline teams, whether that's Seton Hall if they struggle down the stretch, plus St. John's and Providence and Villanova? What do you make of the ACC's borderline teams, Virginia and Pitt and Wake Forest and possibly Syracuse if it has a little bit of a run in it? Uh, do you see a Colorado or a Utah kind of solidified their standing out in the Pac-12? Is there one of those six Mountain West teams that could slip up, uh, New Mexico being the one that comes to mind because it lost to Air Force uh, and, and get itself into a more vulnerable spot? Uh, th- those, are, those are some of the thoughts that I kind of have prevailing in my mind right now. And uh, Do you have you know, one of those SEC teams that has been in decent shape? Is, are they able to recover? Texas A&M and Mississippi come to mind, and they play each other Saturday. So that, that I think, is one of the more interesting games of the coming week. Uh, and then, uh, you, you know, one of the weird trends, usually you're talking about um, the edge of the field being something that you're, you're afraid, oh, well, if Dayton loses the A-10 tournament, that's the spot, or if Florida Atlantic mm-hmm. doesn't win the American tournament. That's, well, those teams are already not in first place. So – Yes, there's technically like they can they can save a spot for everybody else, but the way you're kind of looking at the field right now already kind of bakes them into not winning okay. their conference tournaments. So those two plus uh, plus you know can Gonzaga or St. Mary's take the West Coast Conference? Can Indiana State take the Missouri Valley? Uh, the, those are kind of a handful of of uh, non-power conference leagues uh, that you're looking at to see. Well, is there going to be a bid snatcher or not out there? Uh, but you know the fact is is that the is that you know the edge of the field might actually shift outward. Right. If Florida Atlantic right. wins its league and Dayton wins its league, and both of those are Sunday conference championship games, selection Sunday conference championship games. So there could be some real interest from team thirty-seven and thirty-eight that could become team thirty-five and thirty-six if those teams like Florida Atlantic and Dayton are playing for for championship games that or for league titles that day. He is Patrick Stevens. He is with us here on GCR. Uh, Patrick, has the last week or two showed that there is more balance at the top of college lacrosse? Or is it a reminder, hey, it's early in the season? You know, not th- these teams, these ACC teams, for example, were never going to go undefeated anyway. They're still going to ultimately prove to be the, the cream will rise to the crop by the time we get to the end of the year. Yeah, I think one of the things that I'm taking away is, is that. First off, there probably isn't as big a difference as we thought between 1 and 10 or whatever. Um, but I think the bigger issue is kind of looking further down the board. And, and I don't know if there's if the depth overall, you know, beyond the top 18 to 20 is, is all that substantial. Uh, and so that, that's something I'm kind of keeping an eye on moving forward. But, you know, you look at, you, look at, uh, you know, the the Penn Duke game and Penn seems to do very well against Duke. I mean, I think they've picked them off like six or seven times now in the last decade and a half. So uh, might be something to that. Uh, and you kind of think about, uh, you know, okay, Notre Dame loses an overtime game. Like you take, you have these teams taking one goal losses. Well, there's not a huge difference, right? right. Like right. we could sit here and say, we could sit here and I, I would argue Notre Dame's the best team in the country, even though they've lost, they've lost the game. You can sit there and look at Denver, and they're undefeated. They're also, you know, four minutes of, of play at the end of regulation away from not being all that close to Hopkins, and they won a one-goal game against Cornell. So it's not like they're head and shoulders above everybody. But 
credit to them for having won those two games. Uh, you know, is, is Merrill, do you, how much do you knock Maryland for losing uh, to a team like Notre Dame that was clearly very cranky yep. coming off its loss? You know, what do you make of a Virginia which loses to a very good Hopkins team that clearly can keep up with a fast-paced team like Virginia? Uh, I think the, one of the other things you take away is uh, one of those long-lasting truisms in lacrosse, which is that uh, face-offs really, really matter. So uh, hmm. Hmm. should be very curious to see how things continue to unfold as, as league play gets closer and closer in a lot of these I, it's, you know, I, I work for a team that knows a thing or two about how face-offs really matter. Um, I, I go back to – you bring up Hopkins – did did that teach us that that like Hopkins really does have a chance to compete for a national championship this year? Or to your point, was it the right style for Hopkins to be able to win a game against a team like Virginia, but they might have more trouble against a team like say Notre Dame? Uh, you know, I think any team has potential issues stylistically against some teams versus others, yeah. right? Like, I mean, there's there's strengths and weaknesses at any given time, but you look at this. And, you know, they have hit double figures in every game. Right. Uh, they have played, I think, a fairly consistent brand of lacrosse here over the last few weeks. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that you're going to be uh, great in May. It doesn't mean that you're going to keep improving. Uh, but, but I would be pretty bullish about Hopkins at this point. There's no reason to sit here and think, gosh, this team has shown us these massive considerable flaws. And, and there's reason to be concerned. Like I, I, I think that they're in fine shape. I think if you had offered, if you had offered Hopkins a five and one record at this point when they had games against Denver, Towson, Georgetown, Loyola, North Carolina, and Virginia, you know what? Most coaches probably would have signed up for that uh, rather than take their chances at that point. And so now you've got seven more uh, non-conference total regular season games to go before the conference tournament. Uh, I think Hopkins is in good shape. They've got, you know, a really deep offense, which we knew, and their defense or offense and de- and defensively, you know, yeah, you give up 14 to Virginia, but Virginia's going to get there. Uh, you had four straight games where you hadn't given up double figures. I think there's a lot to like all over that roster right now. All right, Patrick Stevens, it's time for us to play our game. Can you name the MLB teams this player has played for or managed? And I will admit, we're going a little old school with the manager this week because uh, there was a story this morning in the Sun. uh, It was the retro Baltimore reminding about the time that he got into a brawl at the Inn at Cross Keys. So Mm. we go back a little ways and remind that there were actually five teams during a career that spanned uh, from as a manager from 69 to 88 for Billy Martin. Billy Martin 16, first up. 16, 69 to 88. Well, there was the, I believe, a one-year stop to start that off in Minnesota. Certainly was. And then was it, what, like 71 to 73 in Detroit? Correct. Uh, there were five different stops for the Yankees, and yes. I can't give you every last year, but there were five of them. That, that is a hunt. I will, I will tell you there was 75 to 78, then 79, 83, 85, and 88 were the stops. With and the then do we have like a 78 to 79 with Texas? So it was actually 73 to 75 with Texas. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then, of course, the Billy Ball years in Oakland, what, 80, 81, 82 in that range? That's exactly correct, 80, 82. That is so unbelievably well done. Really, really well done. Um, the next one, a two-time All-Star. I, I admit the, the five-teamers have always been more difficult, and he's technically a six-teamer with a few short stints thrown in, but a two-time All-Star, popular personality, doing some TV work now. Todd Frazier was next on the list. The Todd father, huh? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, the Todd father was definitely a red. Yep, where he had both of his all-star appearances. And he was a white sock. For a couple of years. Uh, am I remembering him correctly with the Mets? You are for three years. Am I remembering him as briefly a Yankee? He was briefly a Yankee for 66 games. How about a Pittsburgh Pirate? For 13 games at the end in 2021. And um, I I believe that somehow was surrounded. He was playing in the Olympics, if I remember correctly. Okay. Uh, There was something to do with that. So 
So I am missing a single Todd yes. Frazier. I, I will tell you that he actually left the Mets, joined another team, and then came back to the Mets. And it's the pandemic year, so I don't blame you at all for not remembering it whatsoever. Okay. Well, you know what I'm going to do in this situation. Yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, as, as tempted as I am to just do what I normally do and pick the Dodgers here, I'm going to do a dart throw and say the Rangers. Oh, my that. God. How? How do you remember Todd? I don't. I, I, it, was a dart, it was a dart throw. 31 games Todd Frazier in the pandemic season played with the Texas Rangers. I have no recollection of that or basically anything else about the pandemic season. And so we conclude uh, four teams for a three-time All-Star, a two-time World Series champ. I have no idea how we haven't used him before. Ken Griffey Sr. is next up on the list. Ken Griffey Sr.? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, Ken Griffey Sr. was a red. He certainly was. And he was a Brave. He was. And a Yankee. Yep. And a Mariner. There you go. That's the four teams for Ken Griffey. How about this is a, a, a 15 for 15 today for Patrick Stevens. How about that performance? That is outstanding. All right, what's take, that to the, take that to the Immaculate no Grid. Doubt. By the way, yes. by the way I, just, I just want to tell you, because you will appreciate how excited I was to be able to use Sherman Obando. Oh, that's a great way. What was it? Was it Orioles Reds? What was the? Expos. Expos. Expos okay. slash Nats. Yeah. Okay. That is well done. I actually like Sherman. I don't know why randomly Sherman Obando friended me on Facebook, like in the infancy of Facebook. Huh. And we ended up having some conversations. Really good guy. Really good guy. It was very random. All right. Uh, what's on the docket for you this week, sir? Uh, Georgetown Providence tonight. It's it's a very DC oriented week. Um, and then GW St. Bonaventure tomorrow. American Bucknell in the Patriot League quarters on Thursday. And then the CAA tournament. And then the ACC tournament next week. But uh, I think I'll make a stop at Mason Richmond as well on Saturday. Uh, definitely uh, not 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 too much left uh, in the Baltimore area in terms of college hoops this season. Although Morgan Coppin. Yep over at Hillfield House is something uh, for the locals to go take a look at uh, come Thursday night. And UMBC plays Binghamton tonight. Yeah, so. always worth getting to a Morgan Coppin game. At Discourse, D1S Course on Twitter is how you follow him. Patrick Stevens, always appreciate you, sir. Thank you so much. We'll talk again next Tuesday. Awesome. Take care, Glenn. Patrick Stevens with us as he is every Tuesday here on GCR Talking College Sports. Whew. All right. Um, and we come back in. Still a couple things I wanted to squeeze in before we get to tidbit and two bit to wrap it up on a Tuesday edition of Glenn Clark Radio. The ultimate fan experience awaits you at Sports and Social Maryland. See how we're raising the sports bar with our massive 100-foot media wall featuring 40 HD TVs and a 47-foot big screen. Bet on your favorite teams and this year's biggest events at the FanDuel Sportsbook while enjoying your favorite beers and cocktails, plus our delicious takes on bar food classics. Visit Sports and Social at Live Casino in Hotel Maryland. At Arundel Mills, must be 21. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Hungry? With seven locations throughout Maryland, Glory Days Grill is always right around the corner. They have wings, burgers, salads, sandwiches, and drinks to satisfy everyone, as well as tons of televisions and sound delivered right to your phone. Glory Days is the best place to watch football or whatever your favorite sport is. While you're there, be sure to check out Goose Flights Lager, named in honor of legendary Raven Tony Goose Siragusa. $2 of every can is donated to the Goose Flights Foundation. Glory Days Grill, great food, good sports. Why bet with the big boys this football season? Instead, try your hand with the local book, Superbook Sports, this fall. Superbook Sports is the book next door. Just a dedicated team of the best odds makers in Las Vegas, making sure you get the best prices and parlays anywhere. And now, Superbook will give you a bonus of up to $250 when you sign up and wager on the same day and use the promo code GlennClark23, G-L-E-N-N-C-L-A-R-K-2-3. So bet with the best. And use the promo code GlennClark23 this football season with Superbook Sports. Visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 
Six chicken tenders made from fresh, never frozen Royal Farms world famous chicken, a family sized order of Western fries, honey mustard dipping sauce, and a two liter bottle of Dr. Pepper. It's Royal Farms' new Tucker's Tenders Meal. It's Justin Tucker's favorite, and at only $19.99, it'll be your favorite meal too. The new Tucker's Tenders Meal, available only at Royal Farms. Now you can kick back, relax, and eat like a champion. Real fresh, real fast, Royal Farms. The Toyota Tacoma comes in a range of models and trim lines, so you can choose the perfect Tacoma to reflect your unique personality and driving habits. Check out buyatoyota.com for deals on new Tacomas from your local Toyota dealer today. Gambling can be a fun and entertaining experience, but there are risks involved. If you're planning on betting on the game at the casino or on your phone or computer, know your limit, stay within it. Set a budget and a time to stop. Remember, gambling isn't a financial solution and it doesn't mix well with alcohol or drugs. Know the risks and have a plan before you begin gambling. For free and confidential services, call 1-800-GAMBLER 24-7 or go to helpmygamblingproblem.org. Jeremy Kahn here. The ultimate sports betting experience in Maryland is at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook. Join me at either location in Canton or in Towson and place your bets in person and be a part of the action. It's the best in-class sports wagering experience complete with the ultimate TV package, ensuring you can catch every game all day, every day. Their state-of-the-art facilities bring Las Vegas energy right here to Maryland just in time for postseason football. So visit the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook in Canton and Towson and elevate your game day experience and hang out with me to bet, watch, and win at the Turtle. What company has the expertise to make your home healthier by purifying your air and killing all viruses, allergens, and bacteria? A.J. Michaels, Heating and Air Conditioning in Baltimore and Annapolis, ajmichaels.com. Coming back in here with Glenn and the other guy, uh, uh, Garrett, whatever his name is. You know who they are. All right, back in here on GCR as we continue along on a Tuesday edition of the program. Today's show has been brought to you by Atman's Deli. Every time I just say Atman's Deli, I start to get a little hungrier because oh, it's so good. Man, everything about Atman's is so good. If you're clav- craving that classic New York Deli experience, look no further than the new Atman's Deli in Baltimore's Harbor Point. Corned beef piled high, hand-rolled bagels, and something a little bit different. They've got a bar, Atman's Harbor Point. Go to atmansdeli.com for daily specials. It was not a kind night to our team at Trivia last night. Yuck. Second half was gross. It was all like philosophy questions. And more Bible stuff. Or the, the body human. And like it was just not our round. In fact, we didn't even go three for three. The only sports question last night, sports, was... Maybe you didn't um, find a new, uh, they didn't they, find a new league or... Maybe. We should start a, a a league with more more sport, le- less stuff that you should know, and more just sports and movies, yeah, and sports, TV movie, and music, music and by stuff. pop culture. That's it, just pop culture <laughs> trivia. Um, <laughs> God, the the they, only they must sport- be terrible questions if you can't even. Oh yeah, the only sports question was name the three cities in the southern hemisphere that have hosted an Olympics. In the southern hemisphere, that uh, s- s- south. I'm gonna make sure I have north. Of Sydney. Sydney, of course. Rio. Rio, of course. Yeah, that's where we were. Those two you get um, quickly because they're, you, you know, like. Southern Hemisphere. Yeah. Like. Huh. Mm-hmm. Uh, hold on. Mm-hmm. I'm trying mm-hmm. to think of where the equator is yeah. there. It, not Africa, right? You have to guess a city, Griffin. <laughs> that's how this works. Um. Did they, did, how many times has Brazil hosted? Griffin, guess a city. Well, I, I, I'd be I'd John be Coulson like knows. Oh, John, yes. I could have used John Coulson at trivia last night. Um, let let him guess. Argentina. He I, won't I, just I, guess a city. What's the just capital of Argentina? Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires. That was actually what we guessed because somehow my I thought I might know the answer, but my b- cousin was convinced that like I'm pretty sure Buenos Aires hosted one. I was all right. We'll go with it. Buenos it was incorrect. Aires. What you, Coulson? You know yeah. it. Go ahead. We got Sydney and Rio because of the obvious ones. Oh, you're waving your hands around like you knew. Melbourne. That, that is correct. Oh, really? Melbourne was the other Melbourne. one. Melbourne. And I said, I'm pretty sure Australia hosted one before Sydney. He's pumping his fist. Right? He did get it. Yeah, we could have used him last night. At the, thanks a lot. Could have used you last night. By the way, we had the playoffs on Saturday. Oh. And uh, right. 
even that one, I didn't know a me. I mean, I, I we got it obviously. You guys advance? N- no, we uh, uh. the the final question. We were in second place. We were in great shape, and the final question was: This fictional character has sometimes been seen in both cartoons and video games with his dog Chomp Chomp. You got this? Nope, we oh, didn't. Okay. That's why we didn't make the f- the World Series. Oh man. Yeah. Stupid Chomp Chomp. Yep. This fictional character in movies and video games has uh is sometimes seen with his dog Chomp Chomp. What is it? I I I have no it, like what eras I mean I'm not gonna get it. Like, that wasn't in the question, Griffin. I, I get it, I get it, but like I like is there any way you can? I would tell you it's transcended it? eras. I got no clue. I, go, think about like, Mickey Mouse. I, I, and I I only felt silly after I got the answer. Like think about Chomp, Chomp. Video games and cartoons. More. Video games, although I don't ever remember seeing this character with a dog in a video game. Chomp, 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 so, chomp. So it's a well-known character. It's a very well-known character. But like the fact that he has a dog is—I'd uh, never heard that before. Uh, chomp, chomp. Yeah, I know. Like someone who's Mario, like famous him. for chomping uh, or eating dots. I, I I'm gonna feel stupid when I don't get when I when when you say it. Pac Man. Oh, he has a Pac Man. Never never in my life. What? Not. I, that can't be. Could have been here for years and I would have never gotten Pac Man because I had never heard that. But like Chomp Chomp. Yeah. Makes yeah. makes a lot of sense and I don't know if that's how other people got it or they somehow knew this stupid factoid. His dog looks like Pikachu. If you say so. <laughs> never heard like it's, before. It's like in a my spotted life. yellow. Um, the only sports question on Saturday in the playoffs was uh, name the two, the only two teams who have played against each other three times in a Super Bowl. 49ers. And. No. I'm th- you have not given me two teams. Give me a second team. Well, that's what I, was, I said and. Give me a second team. Um, not them. They're in the same, they're in the same conference. Um, is it is it is it is it that obvious? Would you just guess two? T- my God, why is this so hard? I'm gonna go Steelers Cowboys. That is correct. All right, Steelers and the Cowboys <laughs> played each other three times. <laughs> Not the 49ers. <laughs> well, because like I was going, for, I was like the well, 49ers, 49ers and the, well, the that's why that, that was the part Cowboys. of the process. <laughs> yeah. Because I was like, well, this 49ers is not facing. It's the Steelers and the Cowboys. And we got that. But, it, like, for a second, I was like, wait a second. It's not. Yeah, it's got to be the Steelers Well, because I was going to go 49ers, Cowboys. And I was like, well. You can come up with a bunch that have happened twice. Like, you can come up with those. Obviously, the 49ers and Chiefs yes. now have played each other twice. Uh, the, the Bills It'll and the Cowboys win. played each other back-to-back. Super. But like, you can come up with a ton. Um, the Patriots the Giants. Eagles, The uh, Patriots, Giants, yeah. obviously, played two Super Bowls against each other. Um, you can do that. Eternally, essentially, like you can just keep coming up with them, but getting the third one took me a second. Yes, it is the Steelers and the Cowboys who have squared off three times in Super Bowls. But yeah, it was a rough, rough night. We were in good. We were in second place at the half. We're like, all right, we're oh, in good man. shape. All fell off. We got a. So the way that our trivia works is, you have um, five questions. You can give a one point wager, a two point wager, three point wager. We only got our five pointer. We only got one of those questions in the second half of the game. Got the five pointer. I guess it didn't really matter. It was a bloodbath. And then we were so far behind that we just threw a, an answer in for the final. Like, ah, eh, why not? Just go for it. You know, like oh, we're so, so far tanked. behind that it doesn't matter. It was brutal. brutal. At least you weren't last, brutal. right? Brutal. I, guess that really uh, I think the only teams that were behind us were teams that were like just people that sh- were happened to be eating dinner at the establishment. <laughs> they knew nothing about the trivia contest. And we're like, okay, we'll play. It's just a couple eating dinner. It's like playing along because they're there. I think. N- oh yeah, Pac Man. Yeah, they got yeah. That. Well, no, that was that was oh, the that was playoffs. Sad. They they wouldn't have gotten that one. Yeah, it was a bad, bad, bad showing for a team so Norfolk what, and Way last night. <laughs> what what'd you say? <laughs> yeah, you you, uh, you caught it. So you have to. What, like, what place do you need to finish in for Well, this matter? is only the second week of the new regular right. season, and we won the first week, so, like, you know, we're we're probably fine, but it's just bad. It's, like, losing is one thing, losing the way we lost. It becomes dehumanizing at some point. 
Like you're just utterly demoralized by it. Like every yeah, time man. she asks, well, you get to really, a point where you're like, do we not know what? Anything? And like at one of oh, it's Women's History Month. The second picture round because they do two picture rounds during each game, and like we went five for five on the first one, and then the second one, the, the first one was music videos. And like they were all very famous it's music like videos. Cap. It was a screen cap of the music video, name the song, and they were all very obvious. We didn't even just need to see it a second time. We went five for five easily. The second round was name this woman, which is a very broad. It doesn't narrow anything down in any way. It could, could be, be any woman ever. Yes, correct. So your, mo- could your mom a, could be up there. She could be. Your well, the last one was Agatha Christie. Like who possibly knows what Agatha Christie looks like? Could you guess she was an author? Yes, Agatha Christie is an author. All right. I had no clue what she would have possibly looked like. One of them, I still to this day, Harriet Beecher Stowe. I've never heard of this person. I, I, we, uh, we were taught about her, Harriet. I'm Beecher sure Stowe. you were. I can't remember what she did. Maybe yeah, she was I, a poet or something. I, maybe, maybe she was. Who would possibly know? But yeah, I don't think brutal. she was an author as well, of course. Yeah. Brutal. Brutal. Rough, rough performance from your boys last night. Very, very difficult. Uh, uh, bad news, and you just feel awful for them. Uh, not that you ever root for injuries, but it yeah. uh, looks like the Red Sox likely going to be out with, without Lucas Giolito for the season. Does that speed up their believed pursuit of Jordan Montgomery? Right. Like, we've all along, everybody has always continued to believe that ultimately Jordan Montgomery would end up with the Red Sox, although here we are on March 5th, and it still hasn't happened yet. Does the loss of Lucas Giolito lead to them speeding up the process of getting Jordan Montgomery? I, I think the question would be, do, do the Red Sox really believe at this point that that makes the difference? Like, Look in the division. Do you really think that you are closing that gap by acquiring Jordan Montgomery at this point when you're lo- losing G- Lucas Giolito? I don't know. And it might be their argument as to why they don't do it, but... It's really weird how the Red Sox have just sort of become this. They, they have billionaire, like a billionaire ownership, and they've just been content to be like, eh, whatever. You know, we won some World Series. We kind of don't care now. We're just going to sort of try. Like, it's weird. I don't know what to make of it. But Jimmy always point about the Brewers was interesting. Like, it, it it's it feels incongruent, right? That like they traded away Corbin Burns while also signing and competing, yeah. Um, you know, Reese Hoskins and um they brought back Brandon Woodruff, right? Like what 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 are you what are you doing there? Like are you just looking for purgatory? And it's easy to say like that's just the way that baseball is now. Like you try to have the right group of players, but and I get that the rules change to the point where, like, tanking, it doesn't make as much sense to purposely tank as it did. But there's still a small part of me that says, like, why, if you're going to try, try. If you're not, you don't. Like, why try to be a middle-of-the-road team? Their argument would be, well, the Diamondbacks and the Rangers were middle-of-the-road teams a year ago. But the Rangers were only a middle-of-the-road team by record, by effort, they were anything but a middle-of-the-road team. They spent to be the team that ultimately won the World Series. Like, they built the team that they ultimately became. It just didn't happen for them for the majority of the season. It's, it's weird how it went for the Rangers, but ultimately the team they thought they put together was the team they ended up being, right? They didn't win the World Series by being a middle-of-the-road team. They won the World Series because they built a World Series contending roster. It just took a long time for them to finally play like to, to become that, right? Like, to get that consistency. The Diamondbacks would be a better example of a team that was a middle of the, that was built to be a middle-of-the-road team and just happened to have things break for them and they won, and they got the World Series. And you can make the argument all the time. If you can just get there, then anything might happen. Maybe, but it's still a little bit weird. It's the thing that I said about the incongruent nature of the Orioles going after Corbin Burns for one year and then doing nothing to follow that up. It's incongruent. There's there, Somebody didn't like that word. I don't remember who. Who was it that didn't like the word incongruent, but like, couldn't explain why they didn't like the word incongruent? 
Who are we talking you? to? No, I presented oh, it. Oh, that's right. I presented yeah, it I to remember. a guest. I was like, it just feels kind of incongruent. Whoever it was was like, I don't like incongruent. That's probably right, but I don't like it. Yeah, was that I don't remember week? who I don't remember who it was. I don't. It could have been last week. It could have been the week before that. I think it might have been two weeks ago. I don't remember. Um, but yeah. like, there's an incongruent feeling to it. Like, if if you're going in for this year, then go in for this year. And if you're not going in for this year, then why Corbin Burns? <laughs> like, why the guy that's only going to be here for one year? Is that Jeremy Fowler? That wasn't Jeremy Fowler, was it? Why would Jeremy Fowler have talked to us about the Orioles, Griffin? No, no, no but the, the word incongruent I thought came up. No, incongruent, we were talking about the Orioles. Then was it Will Middlebrooks? No, I think it was before that. Yeah. I think it was before right. that. I don't Gabe remember. Lax. Maybe. It might have been Gabe back. Lax. <laughs> yeah, right. Did you, you not like it. incongruent? Might have been that, that. That smells familiar. That it might have been Gabe Lax that we were talking about that with. Um, it's it's just always odd to me. Like what the Rangers did the thing. They went in, which doesn't mean that every team that goes the Mets went in too, right? Yeah, they got nothing to show for it. I actually happened to have a chat with Buck Showalter yesterday. <laughs> it's just always fun when I look down at my phone and Buck Showalter calls me. I'm like. <gasps> Let's get like the butterflies. <laughs> oh God, that sounds so nerdy, but I just love that man so much. Um, we were talking; to, he was telling me some Mets stories that we'll never be able to share on the air. Oh man, it was fun. We had a fun chat yesterday. Um, but like, obviously, not every team that goes in has something to show for it. It's just weird to me when you when you're purposely doing something in between those things and just kind of hoping for the best. And like, at most, that's what the Red Sox would be doing if they went and got Jordan Montgomery losing Lucas Giolito. Like, eh, you know, we could be in the middle of the road and maybe that'll be good enough. Mm-hmm. So now it's interesting. What? So now they're just, you know, pack it in for the I don't know. The better route? Like, I don't that I don't know the answer to that. Because they still have talent. Like they still have Devers and Casas and like why wouldn't you try? It's just weird they haven't tried more. Doesn't bother me, obviously. Wow, well, may may the Red Sox never really try again. Yeah, yeah, sh- they got they got Vaughn Grissom and Tyler O'Neill. No, I mean I'm not trying to pretend like they've got nothing. They've got talent. Just I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Trevor Story. You know what you should try? You should try Goose Flights beer. Goose Flights Lager, available in cans. At your neighborhood Glory Days Grill, as well as at the Green Turtle Bet Park Sportsbook in Canton. Also available in cans at Alonzo's on Cold Spring Lane. Cans and Sixers are available at Guilford Hall Brewery and Station North. Costas Inn and Dundalk. Sixers and Cases at the Wine Source in Hamden. 198 from every can sold goes to benefit the Goose Flights Foundation, the work they're doing to provide non-emergency medical transport for those in need. It is a collector's can. And it's not, by the way, it's not going to be around for forever. There was a little bit more of a run than we initially thought, but like, it, I, I don't, I don't think at best another run, maybe football season, maybe. Like, that's where we're at. So I, I can't promise you that it'll be here next month. I, I just can't. I can't. I, it, I, I don't know enough. I'm not a beer man. So go get it now. Goose Flights. Find out more about where it's available. Pressboxonline.com slash Goose Flights. Um, okay. I think we covered everything we needed to cover today. Why don't we get a tidbit? Tidbit is brought to you by Superbook. Superbook.com. Download the Superbook app. Use the code Glenn Clark 23 When you sign up, you'll receive up to $250 in a same-day first bet match. Win or lose from Superbook. Uh, in action tonight, UMBC, two-and-a-half-point favorites at home against Binghamton. Navy, a seven-point favorite at home against Loyola. Can bet those games right now. Superbook, Patrick Stevens mentioned UMBC have been playing good basketball of late. I like them at home to cover two-and-a-half tonight at Binghamton, so... I'd throw a couple shekels on I that do. at Superbook. I, I, I like the. Like oh, you I like, like it too. As, you like it as well. Yeah. All right. Well, now yeah. I don't like it as much. Oh, oh. All right. Tidbit, what you got? Uh, Jason Kelsey, who did retire yesterday, made that official, um, and he will go down as. I mean, he's going to be a Hall of Famer, and he will go down as. Yeah, a lot of a lot of hubbub about that, like because it, people it, are arguing he won't be. No, the, like in Philadelphia, you'd say, well, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer, right? And then like other people, are like, think. yeah, not typically the way that works like it's 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 almost impossible for a center to make the hall of fame the idea of a center being a first it's sort of like the way that we're going to talk about justin tucker one day where we're going to say justin tucker is a first ballot hall of famer 
And that'll be an interesting litmus test as Adam Vinatieri comes up next year. Is it Vinatieri or... Who knows? Okay. I, I think most people said it Vinatieri, and then I think some people told me it was Vinatieri, and I just sort of rolled with that. Maybe it's Vinatieri. Vinatieri. Who, yeah, and that might be the more it's an actual Italian name. It's Thierry. Like something like that. Um, but as he comes up for the Hall of Fame, if he somehow were to get in on the first ballot, well then, yeah, Justin Tucker probably gets in on the first ballot because he's better. But is that Vinny, Vinny's this class? What, Eli's this class? Yes. And um, oh, we know the li- well, obviously yeah. the two um, Yonda and, and Suggs. Suggs. Like it's so a that's four of the five right there. Yeah, I don't think they're all getting in, dog. Jared Allen's still waiting. Like, Jared Allen. Jared Allen's just sitting there like, hey, what do I have Jared to do? Jared Allen's the fifth. Tory Holt, you heard of him? All right, Vinny will wait, and then I guess one of those receivers. Yeah, Tory it's, Holt's in. It's a it's a wild, but I, Jason Kelsey, I agree, is probably going to be a Hall of Famer. Yeah, it'd be interesting how Probably. long it takes. But yeah, I don't know that he's going to get in immediately. I I think that it might take a couple of like Jared Allen's still waiting. How long has Torrey Holt been retired now? Like years, over a decade, right? I yeah. mean, it feels like it. I I don't know when. I don't I don't think that he'll be Jason Kelsey. Maybe I'll be wrong because he was so popular. That is always part of this. Because of his popular... Like, there's absolutely zero argument for Eli Manning to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. And in talking to some voters, they don't think he he will, but it still wouldn't surprise me if he was simply because he's so popular and his last name and the New York market and all that. Not, maybe Jason Kelsey's popularity as a person, as a figure, as... His off-field... A good know. guy, yeah, the podcaster... The, you know, his relationship with the Philly market, which is a popular market, like maybe all of those things will end up pushing Jason Kelsey to the forefront. But I I think he's going to have to wait a little while. I do agree that I think he is a worthy Hall of Famer, but I think there's a lot of guys that are worthy Hall of Famers that are still waiting. Go ahead, continue. Tory Holt last played 2009. It's unbelievable. What team was that with? Uh, Tory Holt at the end. Oh, my God. <laughs> Tory Holt. I remember Tory Holt. Oh. He signed a three. He only played one season with him. He signed a three-year, $20 million deal in oh, April I, No, I completely remember Tory Holt. I want to say Detroit, but I think that's because his brother played there. Not Detroit. Jacksonville? Jacksonville yeah. is correct. I, I have correct. vague memories of that. And then he was signed to the Patriots practice squad or something. I know he signed a I one in 2010. He signed a one that. year, I don't one point seven million dollar contract. He did not play at all. Okay, yeah, I don't. I don't have any remember of him. He had knee surgery in training camp, and that was the end of his career. All right, um, uh, Jason Kelsey, yeah, second player in the Super Bowl era to be named a first team All Pro and a Pro Bowler in each of his final three seasons. Okay, good for him. You the who other? was the other one? Yeah, Fir- first team. First, First team, team uh, all, pro all pro and a pro bowler, final three seasons of their career. And he did it in his final four seasons. Tom Brady. Not Tom Brady. Really? It was a, it was another alignment. It was another center, actually. From another 84 to 87. Center. Another center. Uh, wow. So... Uh, Dermani Dawson? Uh, no, not Dermani Dawson. Wow, he only played. Man, he only played eight seasons. He only played it was eighty to eighty-seven seasons. Eighty to eighty-seven. Um, I'm struggling to name other centers. Miami I Dolphins. Why was after that? Miami Dolphins. Miami Dolphins. Miami. Do- I don't know. Uh, Dwight Stevenson. It's a blind spot for your boy, man. All right. Uh, he is also one of five centers to have to be a six-time first-team All-Pro. Can you name the other four? Dermani Dawson. Dermani Dawson is on the list. Kevin Moy. No. One of they will be older, older players. So. Oh God, Jim Otto. Jim Otto, okay. ten-time. First team all. This is asking me to know who, uh, Chuck Bednarik. No, not Chuck. He, um, I think he he only played center like five or like six years of his oh, career. Really? And he 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 was an All Pro center like once or twice, but that wasn't 
always his position. Jeff Saturday? No, not Jeff Saturday. Played for one of them. Played for the Green Bay Packers in the fifties and sixties. <laughs> Guess I'll have to give it to you. Probably Jim Ringo. Oh, you know what? I probably oh, should have gotten Jim Ringo. Okay. I probably should have. And this one, I don't think you'd get, but I because of his name, I have to give it to you. Forties and fifties, he played for the Chicago Bears. <laughs> Seven-time first-team All-Pro as a center. Bulldog Turner. Oh, Bulldog Turner! No, I did not. I did not know about the greatness of the Bulldog. And that was about the extent of a center to yeah, the that's, find. that is <laughs> that is really really difficult, man. <laughs> that is tough. I was trying to act. I don't know why, but I was recently talking to someone about the history of Ravens centers. I think somebody brought up Tyler Linderbaum, and they were like, "Is he already the greatest?" I mean, well, Matt Burke. I, so Matt Burke, you associate, but like Matt Burke, his his tenure was actually short, right? Like it was three or four years in Baltimore. I want to say four. Maybe it was only three. Was it ten to twelve, or was it that he was there in nine? I think uh, it was yeah, nine to four. So nine to twelve. Nine to twelve. Okay. Um. So Jeff Saturday, not Jeff Saturday, sorry, Jeff Mitchell would be on that list. But I don't remember how many years Jeff Mitchell was in Baltimore. It wasn't very long either. Jeff Mitchell would have been... 94 years as well, 97 to 2000. So, so it's just because we're remembering these guys. Because the they end. won the... Yeah. Well, no, you, but you remember the two guys that won the Super Bowl. Right. Like, that's really what... When you think about centers, you're like... So Jason Brown would be in that conversation, but how long was Jason Brown here? I don't think that was very long either. Um, I want to say that was four years. Four years. Four years. <laughs> like, oh five to oh eight. I, I I think the point that we were getting to is that like Tyler Linderbaum is pretty close. We're only talking about two years, and we don't think he's that far away from being able to claim the title as the greatest center in Ravens history. Um, Jeremy Zuta. Jeremy Zuta's in the conversation. Jesus. Played three years. Okay, dude, I, it's. I think we're. Ge- I think I'm getting my answer. Like maybe Tyler Linderbaum. It's not a very high. Uh, the only argument you make is that the other two dudes were the you know the centers on Super Bowl teams. But like, I, I think that's it. I think that's the list of qualifications that you would have at this point for being the greatest center in Ravens history. Uh, Matt Skura. Mm. <laughs> Who else is on this list? I'm even struggling to name other. Uh, A.Q. Shipley. Oh, yeah, A.Q. Shipley. Gino Gradkowski. He, he was only a year, right? AQ? Yeah, I think he was only a year. Like, I mean, it's just, um, it's not a storied history of Ravens did centers. Mike Flynn always played? Mike, Mike Flynn. Flynn was a guard. Oh, okay. At, he did play center, but They're I think. They're into this list, yeah. I mean, technically, yes. <laughs> it's, 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 Tyler Linderbaum will probably be the greatest center in Ravens history very soon. It probably will not take. Much longer before we recognize Tyler Linderbaum as the greatest center in Ravens history. Good for him. This is a weird. I wish I could remember who I was talking about this with. I'm like, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> this is such a weird bit. Uh, but that's the difficulty that centers true. have. It's true. Tough All right. Tidbit was also brought to you today by the print issue of Press Box, which is available at your neighborhood Royal Farms and at the hundreds of locations around town where you find Press Box. Read it all at PressBoxOnline.com. The promise of spring, great dive into the 2024 Baltimore Orioles uh, on the cover in a special section. A lot of la- college lacrosse content in there. Some advice for incoming Orioles ownership. Saw David Rubenstein, by the way, was at Camden y- He was in Sarasota over the weekend, and then he was at Camden Yards yesterday taking a tour and posing for pictures with fans who happened to be shopping at the team shop yesterday. Clearly uh, getting his ducks in a row as far as becoming the owner of the Baltimore Orioles. You like that. Tubular brought to you today by Toyota. You can play Pick'em right now in the midst of the high school basketball state tournament. If you think you know high school hoops, go to countysports.zone and sign up to play Pick'em. Regional semifinals tonight. Get in on the action. It's all brought to you by Toyota, your local Toyota dealer, buyatoyota.com. Here's what's coming up tonight, totally tubular-wise, as we mentioned. Patriot League tournament gets underway. Loyola at Navy at 7 o'clock. That's on ESPN+. Plus. Also on ESPN+, Plus tonight, UMBC's regular season finale against Binghamton at 7. And uh, this afternoon, Mount St. Mary's hosts Binghamton in lacrosse. Huh. All those Binghamton, the, the, a big trip down today. Or they, split, yeah, one of them's together. going west, one of them. Well, I mean, it's not like Mount St. Mary's and UMBC are. Well, you got I guess once you get to seventy, more or less, yeah. then you, you split from there. 
Uh, Big Ten Network Plus, Delaware, Maryland baseball at 4. MLB TV, there is a video broadcast today. The Phillies are doing a broadcast of Orioles Phillies. So if you're a subscriber, you can watch it. Albert Suarez against Zach Wheeler. Yeah. Sure. Um, Big Ten Hoops tonight, Peacock, Purdue, Illinois at 7 o'clock. All the rest of the college basketball you can find at glennclarkradio.com. TNT, Celtics, Cavaliers, 7.30, Suns, Nuggets at 10. Is Booker playing the night? Or? Uh, I wanted to say no because okay. I thought, they thought this, there well was like no update coming well from Well, then they're going to lose by 100, and I will choose not to spend my evening with the Suns. Good to know. I bet against the Suns. pass on that. I don't know what the line is. CBS Champions League action this afternoon. Real Sociedad and Paris Saint-Germain at 3 o'clock. Also on Paramount Plus Champions League, Bayern Munich and Lazio at 3 o'clock. ESPN, Yankees, Mets at 1. MLB Network, Angels, Dodgers at 8. USA for WWE, NXT tonight at 8. Non-sports. Suns are 9.5 point underdogs yeah, against the Nugs. Definitely means Devin Booker's not mm. playing. Um, tonight, uh, Bernie Sanders will be on with Stephen, Stephen Colbert. <laughs> What's he plugging? I don't know. The <laughs> Sidney Sweeney's Nun movie? <laughs> Is that... Why would he be plugging that? Because I don't know what else he's plugging. It's super weird that we put uh, you, you Congress people and, and politicians on his late night show guests. Savannah Guthrie will be on it's with a Fallon. Weird bit. Boy, is there nothing to plug? <laughs> Does no one have anything I guess to not. plug? Don Tolliver will also be on Fallon. Okay. Joel McHale will be on Seth Myers. To plug a Animal new season Contro- of Community. Oh, Animal and I do Animal like Animal Control. Control. When's Animal that back? Uh, is that this Thursday, week? I want to say. All right, say. that is good news. One of the nights this week. That, that, that is a very tonight, good show. But it is coming back. Um, the Cleaning Lady, season three premiere. I d- that doesn't doesn't do a thing for me. I'm an an- animal control guy. I guess I should have you start guessing like what season we are of these shows. Yeah. Alert. Guess what season? Four. Two. <laughs> Tonight also, after the clean. Sure. Uh, Shogun, new episode of that on FX. Uh, and then another uh, book club for you on Netflix, The Program. Oh, what's that about? Hans, Colts, and Kidnapping. It is about... Mm, um, it's got to be focused on one. It can't be like a bunch of different. We need to talk well, about so, one okay. story specifically. Uh, well, so uh, apparently there was... And schools. I think we do need a new one because tomorrow night I think we're supposed to do a book club meeting mm. to talk about Chowchilla. So I think we do need a new one to watch um, after that. Okay. Well, this one... So parents would pay to have... I don't know if you've heard of this, but the parents would... I'd never heard of it. Parents would pay to have their kids like abducted. And taking to like this school or academy. What? And it was called the program. Oh. And they were physically and like psychologically tortured. What the? F- yeah. I and almost it said the really, word. I mean, I so I had never heard of it, but like w- like you watched the trailer on uh, on YouTube. Everyone in the comments was like, I I had to go to this, and it was horrible, and like it was like legitimately like ruined like their lives. Like these people are now like it like apparently I guess it was I don't know if it's still like a thing, but this guy. Apparently, like they would get shut down, and then this guy would just open up another one under a different name. Holy! And F. it was, uh, it looked really, re- it looks really, really horrific. Okay. Um, so. Okay. So yeah, bad, bad. It, 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 it looks bad. I don't know. I mean, potential, potential for your uh, book club, I guess. Looks, looks messed All up right. though. All right. Very. What good. was the one? You, Le- Lover, stalker. Lover, that stalker, one? killer. Yeah. What happened at the end of that one? <laughs> Could be anything. <laughs> Which Could be anything. Oh, they were lovers then. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> You're picking one. <laughs> it was a uh, choose your own adventure, actually. <laughs> Black they were, Mirror. <laughs> they were very happy. That's the way that it worked out. All right. Uh, thanks to. Um, oh God, what are we doing here? Thanks to all of our guests, or yeah. Oh no, I needed to give a sponsor to this. That's what it was. Uh, Tubular was also. Oh no, I, yeah, d- yeah, I do everything. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Never mind. We shot everybody out. We love them all. We'll tell all about them in a second. Thanks today to uh, Femi Ayambadejo. Thanks also to um, Patrick Stevens, to Wes Brown, and John Mioli. We'll get all of it up in the greatest hits section of the... Oh, my God, it's so good. ...tab at glennclarkradio.com. Uh, tomorrow on the program is Drew coming Yeah, in. Drew, stop by. That's sad. Uh, we're like doing a draft, draft segment yeah. with Eric Edholm and Stuff and Things. Stuff and Things. Oh, boy. <sighs> Any updates on the punishments? Um, uh, please. No, please. not yet. Let's get on. Let's get on that. All right, I will. Thanks to everybody at PressBox, all of our great sponsors and partners, including Roos Chris, Live Casino and Hotel, Atman's Deli, A.J. Michaels, Guilford Hall Brewery, Royal Farms, Costa Sin, Superbook Sports, Glory Days Grill, your local Toyota dealer, buyatoyota.com. Thanks to Griffin at Griffin underscore Bass. Follow us, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Glenn Clark Radio. Have a great Tuesday evening. Go Loyola or Navy. Go UMBC. Duke sucks.